welcome to the lecture series that we're doing, Noisy Reality is doing, on the second front in 1942. Uh, we intend to further explore the dimensions of this down the road with looking at the Vichy French issue and the issue with the Italians, etc. There's all sorts of rich topics to explore, but the richest topic today is going to be explored by Gary Gamara, who will talk about the whole question of the feasibility of Operation Sledgehammer in 1942. But let me turn it over to Alex Stavropoulos. All right. Um, so uh, today, this afternoon, we're going to have uh, Gary Gamora, uh, independent researcher, uh, talk to us about um, the plan, uh, Operation Sledgehammer plan for an invasion of uh, France, you know, an amphibious invasion um, in 1942. And Gary's contention that it was feasible and should have been done. Uh, Gary's, uh, well, professionally a computer programmer um, and has a master's in military history. So I think I'll just turn it over to Gary and he can. Um... Uh, as thanks again to Jim of Noise Reality for giving me the opportunity to present my research and analysis about the Second Front uh, and do so split between two presentations. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do my video this time, why not? Um, so we covered a lot last week during my first presentation, which uh, is now I understand posted on YouTube and I have a lot more to cover this time. I hope you find it interesting and maybe even convincing. Um, I will continue uh, to touch on some of the themes uh, from last week, like the German lack of preparedness in 1942 and the negative consequences of Allied uh, dispersed efforts at the time as well, uh, which I maintain were the main causes of their suboptimal performance in the middle years of the war and which uh, also retarded earlier victories and the air and naval campaigns in the contest with Germany. Uh, again, uh, more so than doing alternative history, although we are going to do a fair amount of that. I'm going to try to focus on resources and cap capabilities. So it's, you know, fact and analysis based rather than uh, counterfactual. Um, I, and also I'm going to kind of put to the side, you know, the whole question of the personalities and predilections of various Anglo-American decision makers. Um, okay, so. Uh, as the year 1942 opened, top um, American British uh, military and political leaders, including Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt, found uh, themselves in the midst of a series of meetings in Washington, D.C., the so-called Arcadia Conference. The British delegation, uh, delegation at Arcadia was pleased to learn that despite the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, their American counterparts were determined to maintain the Europe first strategy, the two sides had worked out in meetings between their military staffs that took place prior to the entry of, of the US into the war. Um, in the wake of the uh, Arcadia Conference, many of the top brass in, at the US War Department in Washington uh, began to worry that a unfocused strategy was beginning to unfold for the Western Allies. At first, the unexpected advances of Japanese forces necessitated large diversions of American forces and resources to the Pacific to the detriment of the Europe uh, for a strategy. While this was probably unavoidable in the short term, uh, some uh, leading War Department officers uh, like the up and coming Dwight Eisenhower feared that prospects for a concentrated effort uh, were um, slipping away. Uh, so here's the quote, we've got to go to Europe and fight, and we've got to stop wasting resources all over the world, and still worse, wasting time. We've got to begin slugging with air in West Europe to be followed by a land attack as soon as possible. So um, the, the, the Americans were eager to get across the channels as soon as possible, wh whereas the British uh, for them, the Europe first uh, strategy was to continue with the gradual um, close the ring strategy involving 
uh, naval blockade and um, the bombing of um, of the uh, homeland, German homeland, along with uh, smaller ground campaigns in the Mediterranean. Uh, soon after Eisenhower wrote those words, British planners quite independently hit upon a somewhat parallel concept. Uh, as I touched on last week, uh, the desire to more effectively prosecute the air war against Germany was the genesis for the concept of Operation Sledgehammer. Uh, what I failed to emphasize at that point was uh, always uh, as part of this uh, new strategy or the new um, planning, was the idea that it was to bring some assistance to the Russians or the Soviets. Uh, and by the way, um, if you look at the fuller quote of, of Eisenhower I just recited, uh, he also mentions uh, you know, keeping Russia in the war as being a primary uh, justification for the strategy that he was setting for. So um, the quote I had up here last week, you know, one of the objects, one of the earlier objects that they they considered was, and the one they basically settled on was to, you know, cause protracted fighting in the air to reduce German air support available for the Eastern Front and to assist Russia in the early summer by diverting enemy forces from the Eastern Front. Obviously, this didn't happen in the early summer, uh, but that's what they were thinking of at the beginning. Uh, and that would to involve to seize and hold a permanent bridgehead within the advantageous area of fire cover. Uh, and like I, I mentioned last week, uh, the um, the RAF strategy of, of fighter sweeps over uh, northern France, you know, had not worked out, and they had you know hit upon the idea, which um, I think was the correct one, that really they were could not get the uh, Germans to engage um, in um, intensive uh, air fighting without having a, a, a external stimulus for that, which would be like uh, some sort of a, a invasion, or they also consider a very long standing raid, a long lasting raid. Um, among some of the, um, from the very beginning, there was a dispute as to whether, or there was, there, there, there was two variants that were thrown out, one involving an, um, an invasion uh, right across the, the um, narrowest part of the channel at, at the Pas de Calais, uh, which had the uh, uh, advantage of greater fighter cover. Uh, and, but also they looked at the Ship Codes and Ten Peninsula, the Cherbourg alternative, which um, while it was, uh, did enjoy the same, this is, was farther away, it didn't, didn't enjoy the same um, fighter coverage as Calais would, it had other advantages, in, including the um, most uh, principally the um, ability to easily defend it against a counterattack. And already at the beginning, the lack of landing craft was identified as a leading problem. Okay, so there was a series of talks. Um, the, the, the Americans got wind of sledgehammer somehow, um, and they sort of adopted it as their own. Um, there was a series of talks. I'm not going to go into this too much because it's really covered well in a lot, lot of you know works that are out there already. Um, but um, in early April, uh, George Marshall, uh, the chief of the general staff of the United States Army, went to um, London. Yeah, they held some talks. He felt as though he had the British convinced uh, that they would go ahead with that, with, with uh, um, go all out on preparations for a large invasion the following uh, spring. Uh, under the code name of Roundup, uh, and but also prepare for a smaller um, operation, in this case, Sledgehammer, that might go forward in late summer or early fall. Um, once he got back uh, to Washington shortly thereafter, uh, there was sort of some back and forth between whether or not the British were committed to this, not committed to it, and that all without going into detail, that all culminated in uh, another trip to London, this, this time with Admiral King and Harry Hopkins, the uh, FDR's right-hand man. Um, and this uh, took place around the 19th to the 22nd of July. Um, and uh, during those discussions, um, 
Marshall and King, who at least ostensibly was on board with the Europe First strategy, um, were unable to convince their British counterparts to go forward at ending the deadlock. And given the preconditions that uh, President Roosevelt had given them, that basically defaulted to uh, an invasion of uh, French controlled North Africa, uh, which was then called Gymnast, but then redubbed uh, Torch, uh, which would take place in October or November, uh, upcoming October or November. Okay, so I'm just going to hit real close, uh, real quickly on some of the slides I did last week just to give our, everyone the background. I know maybe some people are here for the first time. Uh, I know, I know for a fact they are, or maybe someone's watching the video. So I'm just going to go through this really quickly. Uh, Germany's strategic situation in 1942, their economy was not fully mobilized for war. They weren't expecting a long campaign in Russia. It was all going to be over quickly. Uh, and, and so they, they, they were not ready uh, for a protracted large-scale land war. Uh, this caused a, a, a dilemma because there were shortages in critical mat, uh, um natural resources, above all petroleum. There's the manpower shortages, the, the, the fight between uh, industry and the armed forces, who was gonna get priority. They both needed large new numbers of men, the, the army because of the, um, the, the huge casualties they'd taken and, uh, and the industry because they needed to gear up for a, a uh, protracted large scale land war. Um, so my contention is by late summer, Germany was stretched to the breaking point on the Eastern Front. There's I mean, the evidence of that last week. I'm not going to repeat it here. Um, and also, along with that, Hitler uh, became more and more concerned uh, about an invasion in the West, and he felt that he, the, the defenses there were inadequate and that a Allied landing there was actually the Allies' last hope for um, to defeat him in the war. Um, I showed this last week, um, and just trying to illustrate the point. Can you see my Can you see my mouse pointer when I move it around here? Anyone? Yes. Okay. So my point is, uh, you know, here's industrial production. Here's 1942. Way down here, here's 1944, way up here. So when would you rather fight? Uh, the Germans were far better uh, prepared in 1944 than in 1942. I went into this some detail last week, so I'm not gonna repeat it all here. Uh, there was some skepticism as to whether or not these, these uh, um, that came up in the Q&A about whether or not these, these figures were inflated. But I think that if you look at different sets of records that are outside the Ministry of, uh, of Armaments, of you know, Spears' influence, the Army records and stuff, they, uh, I would say, very much support, at least broadly and directionally, the production figures as being far higher in 1944 uh, as they were earlier in the war. So I, I don't really think, you know, I'm not saying you can take every one of these last things to the bank, but I, I don't really think there is much. There's been a lot of scholarship done on it, including by, you know, Adam Chews and others, people that are quite skeptical of people like Spear. And I don't really think that the, broadly speaking, that the, the surge in production in 1944, despite the bombing and everything else, is really in question. Um, this is just one statistic I showed last week, which I think is kind of remarkable. It shows you know, the weight of German uh, armored fighting vehicle production. And it shows not only, you know, it gives you a, a, a picture of not only the, the greater number of tanks that were being, or AFVs that were being produced, but that they were bigger and, you know, had thicker armor and bigger guns. So they're bigger and they're better. And there's more, a lot more. Uh, again, I'm going through these real quick because we did do this last week. Um, okay, again, 1944. Okay, so they have more armaments, but of course they're they've been they've been worn down by years of war. Well, no, they haven't. If you look at the statistics for their division, again, this is Army. This is the Wehrmacht records. Okay, um, are derived from them. They have more divisions in 1944. Each division has more men in it, and they're more, they're closer to their authorized strength. They've reorganized them to uh, 
basically, you know, uh, conform with the developments in the war. So, all right. So how do they do this? It seems to be contradictory. How do you increase production and increase the size of the army? Well, you, um, this, this is uh, attempting to show how that is. The blue line at the, at the top is the number of German male workers in, in, in Germany. Okay. And you can see it's going down. Well, why is that? It's not because due to retirements, it's due to the fact that they're taking more and more men from the uh, German industry that were pre previously protected as vital uh, industrial workers and they're putting them in the military. Okay, so that's, you can see the military service is the green line, you get more and more. You can see the difference between 1942 here in the middle and 1944, which is the high point, you know, it's, it's fairly substantial. It's not that huge, but it's, it's in the right direction. Um, and they do that by further exploiting um, the occupied territories, especially bringing over foreign workers. Uh, we talked about the impact of the 700,000 um, Italian uh, uh, POWs that were brought over uh, it, starting in September of 1943, and how that created basically a self-financing campaign for the Germans, and the Allies helped them in that respect. Uh, so that they basically could man all, the, offset the number of worker, uh, uh, the number of men uh, that were fighting in Italy by the number of workers that came in from the uh, Italian uh, surrender. Uh, a couple of things I didn't really, or one I didn't mention, and two other I didn't really, last week I'm just gonna get in here. Uh, over the period of time, productivity improved. Uh, more of the German economy was devoted to war production than in 1942. So each year they, they took more and more of their own domestic economy. And they also squeezed more out of the occupied territories beyond just the manpower. Uh, so for instance, the indemnity that France was um, paying, you know, went up a very large amount to the point where it basically it was a uh, equivalent to 10% of German's war economy in uh, 1943 and the beginning of 44. Okay, um, again, this is from last week. Um, here again, these are from army records. This is not, you know, Speer or anybody back in Berlin doesn't have control over this. These are rounded, uh, but basically I'm comparing uh, the number of uh, armored fighting vehicles that Germany had in, the, uh, in France or in the West, well, basically France, um, in uh, the spring of 1944, as opposed to fall of 1942. So it's basically almost five times as many. And as we discussed last week, they're bigger and they're badder. Um, one of the things I didn't mention, I just ran, I just found this document as is preparing this week. Uh, 899 of that 2000 came in in April and May of 1944. So I suggested that perhaps instead of delaying um, Overlord uh, by one month, if they just moved it up one month, um, they could have saved a lot. Um, that This is just one aspect of that. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this last week, but it was on the slide. Uh, the, the low point of German combat ready tank strength which is 2,504, came on April 1 of 1943, okay? The peak was July 1 of 1944, okay? Well, that's the peak through the end of 44. Actually, in 45, you have some moments where it's higher, but basically it's because I think they're out of gas, so they're still coming off the projection line, but they're not able to go to the front and get knocked out. So, but anyway, through the end of 1944, the high point, so it's more than twice as many, and again, uh, as that other slide indicated, the weight of them are greater, they're bigger, they have thicker, ar they have thicker armor and bigger guns. So uh, the, the Allies pretty much had the same tanks in 1942 42, as they had in 44. The, the Sherman and the Churchill, you know, among the lead of those. Okay, so if you look at all, uh, not just tanks, but all armor fighting vehicles, the corresponding figures of those dates are 42, 54, and 11,143. Okay, October 1 and 8, 1942, it's 5347. So again, well under half of what they had. And again, they were less powerful. All right, again, this was last week. Um, I just want to show this again real quickly. Uh, again, comparing 1942 to 44, um, as we're going to see, um, 
by the time of the July meetings, I, uh, I uh, should have mentioned, um, the Cherbourg version variant of Sledgehammer had basically won out. So they were going to invade the Cotentin Peninsula. Okay, so look at the Cotentin Peninsula here. 30 German combat battalions, not counting those troopen. Okay, uh, as we're going to see in a minute, there's eight in 1942. Okay, and then there's other, these other non combat units as well. Uh, so, again, that was from last week. Okay, so then we can start anew. The review is over for you here, it was here last week. Um, okay, so here's another indication of 42 versus 44, again, from Army records. So we can't, it's not tainted by um, anyone in Berlin. Look at the difference. Okay. Um, in 1944, you have uh, a total of 42. You can almost eliminate these because they're completely obsolete. You could almost say they only have 30 on the entire, this is on the Coat 10 Peninsula. Okay. Um, just on the Coat 10 Peninsula. Uh, if you look at the uh, German records from Dieppe, there was a number of, of Churchill tanks that made it up to the promenade and went back and forth. I wish David here he could tell us how long, but it had to be at least a couple of hours. So there was plenty of time for them to, the German anti-tank weapons to take pot, pot shots out of. And the records record multiple hits on, on all these uh, tanks from uh, calibers, uh, basically these three type, these here, these three here. Okay, so they're going back for two an hour. In two hours, they only achieved two penetrations on Churchill tanks. So, uh, my, uh, you know, uh, Hitler's comment that I mentioned last week that the anti-tank weaponry of the coastal defenses were inadequate was certainly borne out by um, the uh, results at, um, at Dia, strangely enough. Okay, well, let's uh, look at 1944. Um, now, you will notice here, this is a 75 millimeter gun, but it's low uh, velocity, it's 18, model 1897, and those didn't, pr those produced zero of the penetrations uh, of, the, of, the, of the two that were made. They were not done by these guns, which that, uh, they were present there, according to the records. Okay, here you have over 220 that are high velocity, 75 millimeter or greater. So much more effective. Um, these could knock out at Sherman, you know, just about at any range. Okay, 200. So realistically, if you're looking at it effectively, it's a seven times increase. It's, 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 I mean, imagine trying to conquer that um, territory. And that's just, this is just indicative of, you can show artillery, we can show other weapons as well. And we've already shown tanks. Okay, so. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to 1942. Um, the event that crystallized Hitler's concern about a possible Allied invasion were the results of German Air Force photo reconnaissance along the south coast of England in late June of 1942, which detected a sharp increase in landing craft compared to just weeks earlier. Uh, that's, that would be 1146 versus 28, uh, over 2800. Since the British had made no attempt to conceal these, the question of a ruse arose in the minds of some Germans, including the commander-in-chief of OB West, uh, Gerd von Rundstedt. Uh, already in 1942, top German commanders, including Hitler and Rundstedt, had internalized the idea that any initial invasion would possibly be, or indeed probably was, a merely a feint to divert from the true main landing, which would come elsewhere. Um, they also embraced the possibility the Allies could land on the Channel Coast, uh, Normandy and spe uh, specifically, as a diversion for, a li for limited operations aimed at destroying U-boat pans in Brittany. In effect, they had created for themselves a cover for any invasion that might come that year. Uh, well, sort of working hand in hand, um, you have the British Double Cross Committee, um, which is uh, in charge of deception and counterintelligence. Um, by this time, they had uh, developed a cover for Operation Torch called Operation Overthrow, uh, which was aimed at getting the Germans to believe that invasion across the channel was forthcoming in the Cherbourg area. So they're actually trying now trying to get, now that there's not going to be Sledgehammer, they're trying to get them to think that Sledgehammer is going to go forward. 
false reports of British activity across the channel uh, reached Hitler in early September, uh, and he subsequently moved the 7th Flieger Division in southern Normandy 40 miles further north to just south of Saint Salvo. And then again on October 5th, uh, he got he also had received some uh, he ordered uh, units in Normandy, including the a regiment of the Second SS Division, which had replaced Seventh Flieger when it departed for the Eastern Front on higher alert. Uh, then on October 9th, again citing quote agent reports unquote, which obviously were bogus. He direct, directed the rest of the Second SS to Normandy. Uh, perhaps at no other time during the war were the Allies able to fool Hitler and the, his high command so easily, since Hitler was already convinced that Nor Normandy was uh, particularly endangered at that time due to the deception. Uh, German dispositions uh, in early October um, are likely the worst possible scenario for the Allies, and there is reason to believe that false information fed to Hitler to cover Sledgehammer, had it gone forward, could have caused Hitler to redeploy reserves uh, yet farther from Normandy, or at least kept them where they already had been a month before. Okay. So here is the, the sledgehammer plan. I'm going quickly, so I'm going to leave out a lot of stuff. But I'm trying to cram in a lot. Okay. Uh, sledgehammer. This was the. This is basically what you're seeing. And in in, those of you who got the the, the wet bob um, documents last night. This is wet bob. Wet bob is basically just a renaming of sledgehammer. Um, it, it is basically sledgehammer. So I'm just. But it's basically as it existed uh, with the last uh, changes they made to it before they put it on the shelf um, in early August of '42. Uh, sledgehammer would begin with the preparatory air campaign beginning a week before uh, D-Day and using up to 1,200 bomber sorties in a day, uh, well, th though that would represent an extraordinary peak effort, uh, targeting transportation nodes, railways, marshal yards, and training stations and road junctions, coastal batteries, and airfields. On D-Day, Allied fighters uh, with the equivalent of 73 uh, RAF squadrons, uh, that compares, I think, about less than 50 uh, uh, for Dieppe and 22 in the Western Desert. There's only 22 fighter squadrons. So you can get an idea of the, of the difference in air power that they have at their disposal. And if we had time to talk about it more, I would say that actually that's probably on the low side, what they would have available. And that's not included. 1200 planes doesn't include reserves. They wanted to have 100% reserves on hand, more or less. That's another discussion. Uh, 20 of the squadrons would be committed to a standing patrol over the landing areas, of, uh, which would amount to 50 aircraft uh, on D-1, D-3. Uh, again, I think that's on the low side because they don't really, aren't taking into consideration P-38s, which they do have in there. They do show that there will be about 175 P-38s on hand, but they don't really understand the characteristics because they bought a bad version of it and they don't have a good, impression, uh, the falsely negative impression of it. Uh, anyway, um, they would also, fighters would also interdict German reinforcements and maintain a, a protective patrol, uh, as I mentioned. The planners reckon on a seven and a half to one overall advantage in fire strength at the outset and figured that would, but it would drop to like about three and a half to one by D plus 30. Although planners kept the number of support personnel to a minimum, they did provide for numerous anti-aircraft units as well as special RAF engineering battalions for a rapid aerodrome uh, construction. Uh, initial land forces available. This is available, not landing a D-Day, but just available for the operation number three armored and six infantry divisions, uh, six or seven parachute battalions, four glider battalions, and seven commando units. So they had very well-trained units to spearhead the beach landing, uh, which one armored two infantry divisions and two to three parachute battalions would be American. The U.S. was also expected to transport two divisions per month into the theater. Uh, to seal the 17-mile uh, neck of the peninsula at its narrowest, the plan envisioned a defensive line anchored at choke points uh, near each coast at Carentan and Lassay, and, uh, and the possible flooding of the ground. Uh, 
uh, in that area. The seizure of the minor ports of uh, San Vas and Barfleur together with the very large port of Cherbourg promised a near term capacity of at least 4,000 tons. That's what the, the, uh, the uh, plan shows and as we see, as we're gonna see, uh, in, or as they, as they proved in 1944, that the um, capacity was far larger than that. Uh, that was, but that was still necessary to support the planned maximum uh, force of seven divisions. Other places you see eight divisions, even up to 10, but in this particular draft, it's seven divisions, uh, of which they believe only three is required to seal off the, the neck of the, uh, the peninsula. Uh, initially, however, the invaders would receive supplies over the beaches, chiefly by a fleet of coasters, which we're going to talk about more. Uh, which would beach themselves, uh, and we'll only talk about that more, but also, um, but basically they'd be doing most of their work under cover of darkness, um, supplemented by purpose-built landing craft like LCTs and converted barges. Um, the operation would kick off when a force of uh, cruisers and destroyers together with nearly 1,000 smaller naval vessels, not, not counting landing craft, minesweepers, anti-submarine and other auxiliaries would sail uh, it, for last light on D minus uh, one. While other ships manned diversions off Bahrain and the Channel Islands, uh, troop landing ships would arrive around midnight and embark uh, 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 3,400 soldiers in the first wave. Um, the, uh, let's see. So, uh, as I noticed here, that one of the salient features of this is that the initial planning force was just tasked with um, um, with capturing the or, or securing the beachhead, and then they, uh, shortly thereafter, basically at dawn, at high tide uh, or um, on a falling tide, actually, um, or, or no, sorry, just before high tide. Um, they, a number of LCTs would land and disembark tanks and other vehicles, and those would be the exploitation force. Okay. Uh, note that the ground forces were intended to land on what are called light scales, meaning that the bare, uh, using the bare minimum of vehicles. Okay. I also want to mention that one of the earlier drafts from Sledgehammer from mid March listed 26 trained and equipped divisions in the UK. Uh, potentially available for a campaign on the continent, along with 10 as yet lightly equipped divisions uh, that was gonna change during the year, um, as well as 32 independent armored and infantry brigades in various states of readiness. Okay, so this is kind of a, a little schematic here. Uh, any of you guys, uh, you know, they, they arrived at the, Conclusion that Madeline Beach was the best. Gary, place to where's this from? Because I've never seen as good a map as this. Uh, I had I had someone make it up for me. Oh, cool, cool. <laughs> uh, maps at War, <laughs> Tom Hulan. and he retired. As a matter of fact, this is so ridiculously cheap. I always end up giving more than he asked me. But anyway, this is just the one with that. Uh, we're going to have to see this again in a little bit more detail with the German side of it on there. But as you, as anyone knows the uh, history of D-Day. Where that big arrow is, that's Utah Beach, or basically just slightly new north of Utah Beach. All right, moving along. Okay, so any of you who happen to go through uh, the documents from Wet Bob, you might find a variance here, but I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, so this is what I estimate the landing capacity, 70 to 75,000 troops in the first 24 hours. And I'm not saying on D-Day, I'm talking about before or just about by dawn of D plus one, because they're gonna be doing most of their work at night. So they'll get so many out uh, on D-Day. And uh, as you can see from this little schematic here, uh, the LSIs, those are like combat loaders or APAs, um, British terminology, by two hours after daylight or uh, Z plus three and a half, Z being H hour, they're going to be two thirds of the way back to port. That's the plan, anyway. 
Uh, so the whole idea is to do as much as possible undercover darkness to eliminate the air threat, which I think based upon the experience with Dieppe is probably, they're probably more concerned about it than they needed to be, but of course Dieppe hadn't happened yet. Okay, so just to, okay, so basically how do I come to this number is 5,000 airport troops, that means parachute books glider, uh, 15,000 LCTs, there's about 150 LCTs available as we'll see, and then you're planning to put 100 troops on each one in addition to the vehicles that it's carrying. So normally they could carry up to 400 if they're just carrying men. Uh, 50 to 55,000 on LSIs, combat loaders, and miscellaneous other craft. Okay, and these would be split, you know, just notionally two thirds on D-Day and about a third um, the next uh, evening, next night. Uh, just again, um, by ways of comparison, three weeks after Sledgehammer was due to start, assault convoys left British and U.S. ports carrying over 85,000 men. So really it's the 85, these first two, the airborne troops and the LCTs aren't really part of the, so really what you're comparing is like, well, how can they really do that many? We'll compare the 85,000 to the 55,000. Uh, plus there's other factors I won't go into. But, so I, I feel that's highly justifiable. And I, and in fact, really the limiting factor is the logistics. It's not really, you can put it somebody on it, as some of the earlier planners said, you can put people on any sort of, as Joe knows, you can put them on any sort of boat and get as many, a lot of people across the channel. Uh, it's just gotta be able to support them on, their, on the other end. Okay. And also I just wanna mention the Torch had virtually no shortage or logistical capability. So they had to use the same landing craft they're landing troops with they had to use to supply the beachhead, but the, that wasn't a problem for the uh, for sledgehammer. Okay, um, we're not going to go into too much detail, but basically, uh, you might be wondering, well, hope, oh, hey, the numbers you're showing, you know, don't seem to really line up with what we're seeing in the wet bob documents. Those of you who had a chance to look at it, which has not very long, obviously, but this is taken from. These numbers here are the actual numbers that are available in UK. And that's only the ones, that's not even all the ones in the UK. If some, if they're in transport between the port and uh, combined operation headquarters are not included in these totals. So you can see there's 1,200 purpose-built landing craft and another 900 and some odd uh, converted barges that have ramps on them that they're going to use. Um, this is my estimate for uh, available for Sledgehammer. Um, this includes basically, I, I basically took 60% of what the, because the, these, are, these are just what's in the UK, but obviously the US has resources as well on their combat loaders as, you know, as, as they use for torch. So I took 60% uh, of what um, the US uh, was able to use for, um, uh, for torch. And we're talking about about four weeks or a little over four weeks prior. So I think that's a pretty conservative estimate. It might vary, but I can't imagine it by much. If anything, I think that's it probably could be more than that. Um, I could go into other ways, but basically that's how I got to the resources that I felt were available that could uh, support the type of landing density that I just um, mentioned to you. Okay, so the question comes up, oh, you don't have any LSTs. Well, they do have a few. They have three, two or three. But as I mentioned in, very quickly in passing, they were intending to use coasters uh, to do a lot of the logistics, not all of it, but a, the, the, the good part of it. So I'm just gonna read you to, you know, coasters, what is that? Well, actually coasters were a very important part of Overlord. They're just overlooked because they're not very sexy. They're not as sexy as an LSD, okay? Uh, so this is a quote from the official histories, coasters, uh, um, uh, were to be in a, arriving at the second tide on D-Day and were to constitute the backbone of the lift through D plus eight. That was the planning for D-Day, all right? Coasters, not LSDs. And to continue as major carriers through D plus 21. Okay, okay, well, that's great. But, you know, what happens when the storms come in? Well, actually, it was the coasters that came to the rescue. At the outset of the storms of June 19th through 22nd, several small coasters were beached and unloaded at low tide. Later, coasters with ammunition were beached and dried out so they could unload 
directly into track. So that high, that high, the bolded part, that's exactly what they were intending to do for sledgehammer. Use coasters, uh, dry them out, just like the LSTs ended up having. So one of the advantages of the LSTs is it has a ramp and go in and go up. But in dormant, you couldn't really do that. You had to beach them, let them dry out, let them stay there for 12 hours. And then, I'm, so the advantage of the bow ramp was somewhat diminished in that case. Um, but anyway, so this is how, uh, this is showing that what they wanted to do was viable. Also in the last quote, it shows it goes right up to the end, which is in November, uh, one weekend in November of 1944. They, even when conditions shut down, these charges generally, the unloading of beached coasters had usually continued. Okay, so that shows that uh, coasters were a viable alternative. And on top of that, coasters weren't just used on the beaches. They were used to supply uh, through the ports as well. Okay, again, it's in the official diet. I'm not making up any, I didn't really discover any of this, but it's just not really covered really well because they're not very, as you can see, it's not a very se se sexy vessel. Uh, but uh, at the beginning, 625,000 tons of British coaster tonnage was allocated to Overlord, uh, about two-thirds of their fleet. Um, continued demand for them on the con there was, uh, continent would not allow for the return of the coasters to domestic use as originally planned. And at the beginning of 1944, Shape was still demanding a minimum of 500,000 tons. Okay? So they kept going all winter long, a very important part. Okay? So... Um, Again, we're talking about a smaller operation in 1942, and that is 1944, something I covered more last week. Uh, I guess I failed to really point that out this week. So we're talking has has uh, more limited operational objectives, and it's opposing um, forces that are much weaker, which we're going to see here. Uh, Bar Fleur and San Bas, the ports in Normandy with the largest capacity outside of Cherbourg, combined at 4,000 tons a day. Uh, which the sledgehammer plan is only counting on 500 pounds tons a day, uh, and both uh, and both of which figured in the sledgehammer plan were 100% coaster traffic. Okay, so what about global logistics? Uh, that's one of the um, counter arguments. Oh, this there isn't there isn't the logistics across the Atlantic. Well, we talked a little bit about the submarine war last week. Um, just this is a lot of points to hit. But let's compare Sledgehammer to Torch. Uh, by August of 40, 42, uh, Bolero, which is the, the, uh, the build-up plan from the U.S. to U.K., is really hitting its stride. It's finally hitting its stride. The U-boat uh, 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 menace off the East Coast has, had basically gone away, and, and all the, the supply chain was really, uh, you know, had been um, worked out, the problems, the kinks. Uh, what happens with Torch? Churchill holds back ships, cargo ships, for an impractical October North African invasion date. So already we're starting to waste capacity. U.S. Army uh, already by September is, is discharging 8,000 long tons a day in, US, in the U.K. That's just U.S. Army. That's enough to support 15 divisions. So actually, even in wake of Sledgehammer, if they're supplying half the, the, the divisions there, they're still going to be uh, um, building up a surplus. Uh, the torch causes the shipping to be thrown into chaos. Um, okay, so as we said, as I said, several hundred thousand tons of, uh, had already shipped to the UK by October, so the Allies could leverage that. Now, in the, with torch, the U.S. ships, because of the chaos, were sending, sending redundant cargo because they were getting lost on the other end. And then, so sometimes things were being shipped two or three times. And then after that, it all has to be transshipped to North Africa. More wasted resources. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to skip a couple things because we've got a lot here. Uh, but basically, a concentrated anti-submarine effort ought to have meant uh, uh, fewer losses. That's something we talked about last week. Dispersed, dispersed anti-submarine effort means increased losses. That means the bad month of November, the worst of the war. Um, resources could be used earlier Resor with, with sledgehammer. With torch, resources sat idle. 
discharge cargo close to the battlefront as opposed to discharge cargo far from the battlefront as in North Africa. And it was very difficult to get it from the ports to because the there was bottlenecks in the uh, transportation infrastructure between the ports and the battlefront in Tunisia. Okay, this is an obvious one. It's a 150 mile round trip from the UK as opposed to 4,500 mile round trip. Obviously, that's a much better use of your, re your, your shipping resources, okay? Uh, that's for the UK. For the US, the average turnaround for the UK uh, was um, 60 days, whereas for Mediterranean, it was 75 days. So there's another 20 to 25% increase in your capacity. Um, so uh, again, the coasters come into play because coasters are not part of the uh, transatlantic uh, cargo traffic. So anything you can put in a coaster and you figure for uh, at the beginning, probably it's gonna be less than more than 50% British and probably at least 50% British for the longest period of time. Well, they're gonna take their production and use coasters. And so it doesn't take away at all from cross Atlantic traffic. Um, with torches, 100% ocean going vessels. So again, uh, the torch, the sledgehammer planning uh, showed that they might lose 950,000 tons of uh, cargo because of the competition with this torch uh, shipping. And that, but that's on an annual basis. With torch, they were losing 800,000 tons monthly. It actually, it actually created something of a, of a crisis, of a raw materials crisis. Okay. Moving right along. I'm talking this to death, so I'm not going to skip over this, but anyone wants to bring up the canard about the 1 million tons that we're going to be saved if you open up the Mediterranean, I've got, we can come back to this and we'll talk about it for 10 or 15 minutes, but it's at the million tons were never saved. The, the, really, the, the meat of this is that within weeks, the UK alone was employing 1.8 million tons of shipping just to support Torch, not the 8th Army. Just toward that doesn't count the U.S. and there's many other factors. Okay, let's get back to the sledgehammer opportunity because it's about global. We're talking global logistics, right? Here's a quote from a uh, report from early 1943 by British presented to the British War Cabinet. Both we and the U.S. can produce immensely more than can possibly be shipped. Okay. So there's lots of resources out there. And this just gives you an example of one thing, the 42,000 tanks and self-propelled guns that they produced in 42. And actually actually kind of a ridiculous number because under the best of circumstances, they could never use that many, even if Sledgehammer got forward. But I'm just giving you the idea that the rationalization of global logistics offered huge potential paybacks. Okay, we talked about this a little bit last week. I'm not going to go into this uh, again, um, because, but I just want to bring it up because anybody here for the first time is going to be saying, yep, yep, you know, and basically the defenses were much stronger at Dieppe. And, you know, as a photograph, if you can see that, it uh, shows uh, this is actually taken on the day of the of Jubilee. Um, I think that maybe smoke or something off the left. But anyway, you can see the formidable um, terrain there that they had to overcome, right? Terrain makes a difference. Uh, again, just touching on this, again, you can see this is this is Utah Beach in 1944. So it's obviously, it's just it's just a sand, uh, a sand burn, a high sand burn that is, the terrain is obviously much more favorable for the, um, the assault teams. Uh, than, it, than it was at Dieppe. Okay, but here's some of the things that actually, if you think about it, Dieppe show that were favorable towards the 1942 invasion. The attack convoys got through man fields without difficulty. Landings generally more accurate and timelier than over Overlord. Uh, German coastal batteries were vulnerable. They weren't encased in concrete. They were they were in open positions. Uh, at, and that enabled the commandos to knock out one with just a small mortar round. GAF, uh, the German Air Force, could not effectively counter naval units or the, or the convoy. There's only one bomb hit hit the, the entire day, even though uh, 
and they suffered unsustainable losses uh, despite uh, more favorable circumstances than they would have had, uh, uh, at least objectively speaking, uh, for a sledgehammer. And we already mentioned about the German anti-tank weapons being inadequate. Uh, again, this is from last year, uh, last week. Uh, I'm not going to go into any detail. Uh, I do feel like uh, that I uh, realize now that this was uh, people were misled a little bit about these dates in the square brackets, which relate to when these um, divisions left of the Eastern Front. And I think there was the thought that what I was trying to say was, oh, gee, the uh, the Allies can wait till most of these have left of the Eastern Front and then attack and that is more favorable. That's not the point this is meant to display. Really what this is meant to mean is that if they just held the, all of these in France, the impact that that would have had on the Eastern Front. Um, we're gonna touch on that a little bit later, so I'm not I'm gonna go ahead past here. Okay, so here's a, that same map, but now I've overlaid um, the German um, um, units using their symbology just because I like it, but I guess it's sucked for anybody who's using the NATO symbology. <laughs> but my point here is basically what you have here is a big donut hole, okay? And if you look, remember back to the other map, there's a lot of troops here in 1944. Here, it's basically empty. So they got the back door into Cherbourg is basically open. Okay, there's one battalion here, uh, and that's pretty much it. This is pretty much open, and uh, there's going to have uh, with the uh, paratroops landing in the rear, 20, potentially up to 2,500 each one of these places. They're going to be in good shape. Um, Here's a couple of pictures from last week and go over move quickly. But this basically shows that the Atlantic wall here, this is from September 4th. There's not, this is where they're going to land. There are no completed uh, fortifications here. There's one partially completed. It's not even on, it's not even, uh, I'm pretty sure that's a, at the Crisbeck batteries. That's well off. Even if it was, uh, they landed here by accident, it's not going to come into play. And, and it was somehow completed in a week or so between this map and when they landed. Okay. Um, this is a detail. These are individual weapons. It's got maybe a half a dozen machine guns, two uh, anti-tank guns, which aren't really going to do anything because the tanks aren't coming, so they're knocked out, and one heavy mortar, uh, and that's pretty much it in a, in a searchlight. So basically, they're going to have two battalions landing against one platoon, 20 to 1 advantage, 20 to 1 advantage on terrain that's not favorable for the defense. You go on and on about that, but I think that says it all. It's not going to be like the app, other than places like Green Beach, um, which we talked about again last week. That's the, the analogy. Okay, so what is the German buildup? I'm sorry for the bad map here, but I did want to illustrate it. Um, and this is actually the plan of the SS Panzer Corps, not yet the second SS Panzer Corps, just the SS Panzer Corps. This is their plan in, in, in accordance with Rundstedt's um, philosophy of how to stop the invasion. And as you can see, they're going to stop, they're going to deploy. This is six, you can't really see it very good because it's terrible. Uh, but anyway, this is six, the Bevego, this is the movement of the Sixth Panzer Division. It's going to stop here. The uh, second SS, the Das Reich, is going to stop here. Hitler, has, uh, and he's anticipating a landing on the north, and this is the infantry division holding him off. This is the shield, this is the sword in German parlance. And um, Rundstedt has no intention of getting his tanks caught up in the hedgerows of Normandy, okay? He wants the best tactical, he wants to concentrate his mobile units and he wants it on the best tactical ground. Well, this is good ground because you can use your tanks and you can't use them up there. Now, I'm not saying that this would have lasted very long um, because I don't believe Hitler would have gone for this, um, but um, this was the plan and certainly would have delayed the response in my opinion for great reasons we could go into more in a Q&A. Um, here's, uh, 
based on other planning documents from this time uh, that uh, from this time in place, France and, and the uh, late summer of 1942. Uh, this is my estimate of how quickly these all, these are the main reserve units could arrive at Carentan. Okay, and by the way, um, the plan was always to send some by rail and some by road. Uh, although both Hitler and Rundstedt were very much in favor of doing as much by road as possible for the reasons I went into last week and I'm not going to repeat here. Okay, but what's the problem with sending them by road? They don't have any fuel in October of 1942. Now, obviously they may have them someplace, but if you're just looking at a very important unit like 7th Panzer, this is its fuel situation. This line up here is, is what I'm saying is the minimum that it could operate around and I think that's a conservative number of 100 uh, cubic meters or 100,000 meters, okay? As you can see, for most of the month, it's way down here, okay? Obviously, they probably have some reserve someplace, but you have to be in pretty bad shape to keep an important unit like that. They're not really able to train. Uh, Six Panzer, I don't have their uh, same similar records, but they are reporting that they can't train at this point in time either because they don't have any fuel. And it's just the fuel shortage thing is through, all the records everywhere you look, even when you're not looking for it, you see it. They they also have a sort of ammunition, uh, mines for the beach, et cetera, et cetera. And also uh, hold out the prospect that uh, mixed road and rail movement is vulnerable to disruption and also synchronization problems. Okay. So since I'm already an hour into this, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna go over this quickly, but uh, we talked about this last week, and I really feel that the uh, narrative that says that the Americans or the Allies generally were substantially improved uh, by uh, 1944 is not really um, borne out by the evidence. Uh, I, I failed to find any evidence for it. I'm not saying there is none there. I'm not saying there hasn't been some improvement, but the idea that there's been a renaissance, I just don't, I, I don't see it. Uh, it I, I would say that the quote unquote improved performance that you see, in other words, you don't have any major setbacks is basically due to logist, improved logistics, air power, naval power, the characteristics of the battle area is compact, it's on defensive, highly defensible ground, and it's basically a positional warfare. Okay, uh, I am gonna cover this in a little greater detail than I did live. We had some of these quotes last week, but I just wanna, go to emphasize this. So we're, we're gonna bring in the expert on fighting the allies on the ground, Erwin Rommel. Here's what he had to say about the British American uh, capabilities in 1942. Okay, here's the first quote. The front had now in the summer of 1942 grown static and the British command was in its element for the modern form of infantry battle and static warfare was its strongest point. His endeavor had been to escape from the rigid static warfare in which the British were masters. This is already 1942. This is before Montgomery arrives too, by the way. And to gain the open desert where it could have exploited our definite tactical superiority, superiority in open desert warfare. So that's my argument. There isn't a great improvement in allied performance. They're just able to fight their battle and prevent the other side from fighting their battle. The battle, the Germans want mobile operations. The allies, generally speaking, want positional uh, static operations. And that's what they're gonna get in, this, in a sledgehammer op, uh, campaign. Okay, here's about the Americans they are supposedly so terrible. At Cassidy Pass, the Americans had fought extremely well and our losses had been considerable. Uh, talking about the next day, and this is with the, uh, facing the U.S. 1st Infantry Division. Our men had been astounded at the flexibility and accuracy of the American artillery. This is their first time in action against, on a large scale against the Germans, which had put a great number of our tanks out of action. When they uh, were later forced to withdraw, the American infantry followed up closely and turned the withdrawal into a costly retreat. This is a day after, or two days, one or two days after the breakthrough at Casimir Pass, okay? 
American troops may have for their ex lack of experience by their far better and more plentiful equipment and their tactically more flexible command. Okay, again, this is Rommel. This is not an armchair historian like me. This is someone who was there fighting them. Uh, he also mentions with respect to American air power, in the wake of the German withdrawal from the Kasserine Pass, um, German forces were subjected to hammer blow air attacks by the U.S. Air Force of a weight and concentration hardly surpassed by those we had suffered at Alamein and gave us an impressive picture of the strength and striking power of Allied Air Forces. And I want to point out that when Rommel is telling everybody in 1944, you guys have never seen anything like the uh, Americans or what the Allies could do, the Anglo-Americans could do as far as air power. He's not talking about what's going to come. He hasn't seen that yet. His frame of reference is what's happened in El Alamein and in Tunisia, where the Allies had far fewer air resources than they had in Southern England at the time. Okay, so he's talking about, uh, oh, I think that's self-evident what point I'm trying to make. Better. Okay, I'm not going to go into this. Uh, because it's too much, but again, it's a, if we want to come back and talk about whether the Allied, the Americans especially, had improved, we can come back to this slide afterwards. Um, amphibious operations, putatively the most difficult. Well, I would say they're the most successful. They almost always succeeded, no matter who was doing it. Here I have depicted Russian troops. The first large-scale amphibious operation against the Germans were by the Red Army in December of 1941. Yes, December of 1941, when they took over the Kerch Peninsula. They had no special landing craft. Here they're coming off a trawler. They had no special training, no, uh, no doctrine as far as I know. Of course, they did pay for that in higher casualties, but they did still pull it off. So uh, if you really look at the, you know, just try to list uh, the ones, that, that didn't succeed in terms of being driven back into the ocean or to the sea, and you're not going to come up with very many. Okay, I want to read one more. Um, early in the Salerno invasion, British intelligence officer Norman Lewis came upon the shocking spectacle of, quote, American officers abandoning their men and um, an outright panic among the troops left behind. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, here's the quote. In the belief that our position had been infiltrated by German infantry, they began to shoot each other. These are American troops. Uh, what we saw was an ineptitude and cowardice spread down from the command, and, the resu and this resulted in chaos. What I shall never understand is what stopped the Germans from finishing, the off, finishing us off. Okay, so evidently the lessons of Catherine Pass, which I claim are illusory anyway, uh, you know, had yet to take hold even seven months later. But when Le uh, Lewis later just uh, returned to the site, he discovered what had stopped the Germans, naval gunfire. Upon returning to the scene of the battle, he observed numerous wrecked German tanks. Several of these, uh, quote, several of these lay near or, or in tremendous craters. And he goes on to add some grisly details about the uh, remains of German tank crews, which I won't repeat. So basically, this is their ace in the hole. I mentioned this last week. They had plenty of naval gunfire support. And this is, it's, it's really quite striking if you go into the, what was available. Just look at what was used at Torch or what was available in the Pacific and not otherwise being used. Okay. So we're getting close to the end. <laughs> um, so here again, the sledgehammer opportunity. I have a quote from uh, Free, uh, General Fromm, who was the, uh, the chief of the Arizots here, which wasn't just the replacement army, he had a, lot, a wide brief involved uh, planning for production planning and such. If an attack on Sherbrooke could coincide with the major offense in the East, they may cost us the war. This is from the fall of 1942. So it's not just Hitler that's spreading about him. It's someone who's actually quite critical of Hitler. Um, 17 German divisions transferred from east to west between October of 1942 and March of 43. Um, uh, six Panzer Division alone played a major role in bringing an even greater disaster for the Germans at the end of 1942. Potential. It's obviously counterfactual, so we can't prove that. But basically, um, 
And what's happening is the Sixth Panzer Division uh, constituted the major com uh, offensive power in the relief drive for Stalingrad, okay? Um, there was one other Panzer Division, but it only had a handful of tanks. It was, it was definitely worn, worn down. Um, at that point in time, the Soviets had already been planning a major counteroffensive against the Italian Eighth Army, and they were going to smash the Italian Eighth Army and then use the, 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 uh, their Second Guards Army. Uh, you know, I've seen it stated that it was the strongest military formation in the Soviet Army at that point in time. They were echeloned behind the attacking troops and were expected to drive on Rostov. Well, the attack went forward, and that's Operation Saturn. Uh, but when the relief drive got going, kicked off with 6th Panzer Division, they decided to take 2nd Guards Army and use them against the relief effort. Probably overkill. Monstein seems to think that they didn't really need to do that, but that's what happened. Now, with the 2nd Guards Army mess, you know, made it to Rostov, we don't know, but they came within 20 miles at some point. And so they came pretty close and that would have cut off two more armies, first Panzer Army and uh, the 17th Army and actually the remnants of fourth Panzer Army that wasn't already um, trapped in uh, the Stalingrad pocket. Okay, uh, during the major German uh, counterattack of March, uh, uh, February, March, 1943, six of the eight infantry divisions and five of the 10 mechanized or armorized divisions were units recently redeployed from France. Okay, so this is a terrible map I know, but it shows, <laughs> I'll just kind of point, this is 6th Panzer, this is 15th infantry division, this is the second, uh, uh, the second SS, that's right. This is Totenkopf, which had come back in October and refitted, come back to, to France, and then transferred back to the Eastern Front. Uh, up here is first SS. So you can see some of the main, these are all divisions that had just been kept in France. They didn't even, they didn't even have to just transfer anything to, from the West, uh, Eastern Front. They could have had a major, major impact on fighting in uh, the east. And here, by the way, is the uh, Gross Deutschland finally going to the west, Frank. There it is. It's going west. All right. To sum up, finally, the sledgehammer opportunity made while Germany was overextended, acknowledge and leverage geographic realities. It has to do with global logistics. Leverage Western allies' existing capacity, that's including their industrial capacity, trained troops, their aircraft, the coasters. Uh, you can just go down the line. Uh, there's, there's resources sitting on the sideline for months and years, not really doing anything. Uh, maximize strengths while minimizing uh, Germany's strengths uh, at tactical and operational levels. We talked about on that a little bit. Has to do with positional warfare versus mobile warfare. Uh, basically, I think of it as combined arms at a strategic level, bring all of your, your Navy, your Air Forces, your ground forces, and bring them together in one operation instead of scattering about the, the world. Uh, in other words, as much as possible, you're not obviously able to do that completely. There is a war in the Pacific, and something has to be done in North Africa. Uh, impose, impose a series of dilemmas on, on the Germans. Okay, we didn't really talk about that, but basically everything that's going to happen is a dilemma. Okay, do I bring divisions back from um, France? I mean, back from the Eastern Front. Uh, what are the French going to do in my rear? Do I invade them? Well, if I invade them, do I have to go into Tunisia? Oh, do I use up my gas, getting all these uh, reserves up to Normandy when it could be just a diversion? And that, that whole thing in itself is a different, do I use my air resources, what do I do? So there's just a number of dilemmas that are gonna you know, come forward to the Germans um, in the wake of a, of a sledgehammer invasion. Uh, and the concentration on main strategic objective and synergies with the Eastern Front. Okay, <laughs> believe it or not, I'm done, except I have one more okay. slide. <laughs> and this is why, this is really the main reason, and it's political. 
This, this ironically comes out on October 5th, 1942, which uh, from the previous uh, time you may have noted that that was the, uh, the date that Sledgehammer might have gone down. And, you know, basically the Western public had to hear, get lectured from the Soviet Union about how they were not fulfilling their obligations. And from the Soviet, from the Soviet perspective, uh, it was hard for them to understand the two great powers combined could not take at least a poorly defended and exposed peninsula just a few dozen miles away from one of their countries. All right, well, thank you for listening to me. And <laughs> this will do. Okay, Keep great. Going. I think we have a, we have a bunch of questions, but here, um, Gary, can you stop, share? Because again, I got, um, I found this thing in Joe Strange's, um, which actually you may have looked at. Yes, yeah. so let me, because uh, it'll, I'll actually just basically <laughs> take my question from it. Because this is, um, oh, I'm, you know, you've read Joe's uh, dissertation, yes. so I'm sure you've actually seen this. So again, so this is this, well, I don't know, famous, infamous uh, war cabinet meeting, um, I guess, uh, minutes, where here, Alan Brooke, I guess, himself um, assesses <laughs> Sledgehammer and you know puts it down so here so i mean i think a great place to start uh, and so then again you know, everybody of course you can <laughs> use use your um uh you know the reaction button and you know raise your hand to ask questions but you know let me just yeah so again so his is there again this basically the british assessment to kind of nix it so here again their assessment is well it's on the fringe of air cover um and well here's the big thing i think that they argue that um, they could only maintain six divisions through Cherbourg and, you know, plus additional units, and that you needed at least 10 divisions to hold, again, what was, you know, a 100-kilometer line, um, you know, to the south of the Cotentin. Again, then he bring, they bring up the issue of air power. Okay, we got to, uh, we think well, the Germans have 230 bombers. They can move reinforcements in quickly. And they said, you know, they did that in Malta, uh, did that in France. I got, you know, account. So here they can bring in at least six to 10 divisions. They got 284 against the Russians. Um, right. The, uh, as Jim has pointed out, there's the issue of bringing in Italians. Um, but yeah, I think the big issue, and then, you know, it goes into the issue of uh, bomber, fighter strength, those I'm sure we can debate. Um, but I think here, the other big issue, again, is they point out, okay, well, they argue that Cherbourg could be destroyed by the Luftwaffe and essentially knock out the main port. So here it only covers a few acres, could be primary objective of enemy air attack. We would be should be exposed to day bombing with fighter protect. However, no doubt we should take a heavy toll of the air attackers. We should we thought that after six months the port would be a heap of ruins and would not provide us with more than sh sheltered water. So essentially, I guess that they would cut off supplies by knocking out Cherbourg. So I guess that's plenty of objections. So uh, yeah, uh, yeah, respond to Alan Brooke over the over the set, the decades. <laughs> I actually <laughs> but, um, wanted yeah. to. When I first thought about what I was going to do this week, I actually was going to start with that and refute that. <laughs> okay. But then I decided I had too much other stuff to do. So now you gave me the opportunity. First of all, it starts out, I mean, maybe this is too strong of a term to say it's a lie. But he says it's going to be 100 kilometers. That's nowhere in the plan. It's 17 miles. That's basically four times of what it's really going to be. So in other words, he's, uh, by the way, this is, this is a, something he's, he's addressing the war cabinet afterwards and giving them the reason why. And by the way, did you notice there's one thing that's not in there? Why doesn't he just say there's not enough landing craft? That's generally a showstopper every time, right? And that's what's come down, handed down to us in, 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 uh, in history, in the history books, because he knows there is going to be more landing craft. And he knows that the war cabinet knows there's going to be more resources then they've actually told the planners. That's a whole other area that I'd like to go into. I would have liked to go into. The planners for this, what you're seeing, uh, when you look under the number of landing craft in that, uh, um, and uh, landing resources in the wet bob papers, it's not true. They have, 
they have basically hidden from their own planners or maybe maybe it wasn't done purposely. I, I have a hard time believing it wasn't, but let's just say it somehow it was um, accidental. So for instance, the, um, Wait, let me get back to it because I want to address the, the group thing first. So first of all, he, he paints a really bad picture. He really, in my opinion, if you look at the context, he's make, trying to make Marshall look bad and irresponsible, okay? He says, oh, the Americans can only do three out of the 10 divisions. Well, they don't need 10 divisions because you only, the plan calls for three divisions because you only have 17 miles, not 65 miles, okay? That's number one. Number two, the plan says specifically, starting in September, the Allies, the Americans are going to start bringing, they already have three, oh, well, they will, in August, they're already bringing over themselves. So by the end of August, they already have three divisions in theater, okay? The first division comes over in August. That's scheduled to happen and does happen. And starting in September, they're going to bring over two divisions a month. So already they're going to have five divisions in theater, plus whatever they could bring over on land, uh, their landing ships, okay? So he's just trying to make Marshall look bad and irresponsible in front of the other political leaders. But I think the big question is whether they're right on that six division number. Because if if they're if that's right, then I, you know, the Germans can basically chew, you know, because also if you look at, you know, what they say, okay, if we do this, if we do uh, Sledgehammer, that means we're committing to round up in 43. So we got to sit mm -hmm. there for, yeah. you know, half, half uh, more than half a year and then, you know, mount another landing. But, right. you know, then that means the Germans are have months, you know, the, they can, you know, send their troops to Russia, stop the, then send, you know, additional, obviously they're forming additional troops and then they, you know, send more and again, you know, and say in February, they can, the argument would be, okay, at that point, you know, they, they mass 12 divisions, including some, you know, two or three panzers, and they push the, you know, the Cotentin forces into the sea. And, you know, either you have a, you know, another evacuation and then all the political effects of that. And, but yeah, so I think that the big question for me is, and again, of course, we one really then need to look into the logistical issues. And then of course the issue of, could they have destroyed Cherbourg? Because obviously if they can, if they're right about that, then that's, that's a, a big problem as a major, you know, they're dependent on that as their main port, I think. So, uh, okay, trying to address well, those. There's a lot of issues. stuff there, so I'm going to try to get yeah, some. Yeah. <laughs> no. First of all, um, the goal was to take Cherbourg in two or three days, okay? When we reviewed this with uh, Joe the, uh, a couple months ago, uh, before I even mentioned that, he looked at what was going to go down and he came up with hey they're going to take it i can think they can take it in two to three days i don't know if i'm reading it too much of what you meant joe but that's that's what he thought it's basically undefended they had three weeks to do demolitions in 1944 three weeks and if you look at the record some of the biggest explosions are going off two and plus weeks into the whole time so they're, they're taking they're building up uh, the information I sent you the other day, I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, but basically multiple historical sources confirm that the destructions were more spectacular than effective, okay? The biggest problem was the pressure mines, okay? We can go into why that was, but they couldn't sweep the pressure mines. Well, there were no pressure mines in 1942, okay? That was the biggest problem. So first of all, there's every expectation that they're going to get there before they can do substantial damage. And even when they had three weeks, they weren't able to really blow it up as sufficiently as, as you would think. Plus you have the two minor ports, plus you have the, there, there's redundant, um, there's redundant opportunities for supply. Now, I don't think that they're thinking that they can supply over the beaches for that long, but I think they're gonna find out just like they did in 44, the beaches were more viable than they thought, okay? Um, so that's that. Plus, the whole argument about them blowing up the three acres, that they say, he says it's only three acres of, of dock lands or something, which is kind of yeah. bogus, like they're not going to be able to repair them. But the planners have already anticipated that. I guess Brooke should have taken some time and read the plan. He said, and this is something I noticed even before I knew, knew that the planners had thought of this, but it was something I thought of. It was like, well, well, that's a crazy idea, but it actually wasn't. They noticed there were beaches inside the, the inner and outer harbors. 
that mm. they could beach landing craft on, even if the uh, port was blown up. Okay. Plus, if you look at the number of aircraft that that, that uh, Portal says that, that the Germans came up, it's extremely unlikely. But even if they, they could bring that many, but even if they did, that would already be a victory. The point is helping the Russians, helping the Soviet Union. The only place they had a quote unquote reserve, they're, tra they're stretched to the max, the Luftwaffe, as we talked about last week. The only place where they kind of have a reserve, a, 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 a swing force was at Stalingrad. If they're going to bring all those over, they got to bring them from Stalingrad. If you read the history of Stal the battle, you know, that was their trump card, is what Chudikov was always saying. Okay, was there, so they bring them away, they've already helped. The battle's really for the narrative. This is the thing, we can't think of it in 1944 terms. We have to think of it in 1942 terms. Mm -hmm. No matter what happens, if the Allies can say, we help them at Stalingrad, okay, now we know now that they didn't need that help, right? But, mm -hmm. yeah. we, but that's not what was gonna happen in 1942. They're gonna see that we landed, then the Soviets made a counterattack, and they're gonna say, hey, we must have helped them somehow, and they bring a bunch, a bunch of aircraft back. That is, that's one way of doing it, okay? So, uh, but even though they had brought back that number, they could not sustain a, 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 a long um, air campaign because they didn't have the, they weren't able to replace their pilots because of the fuel shortage. We talked about that last week before their five fighter schools were, were shut down. Okay, so that's what they wanted. It's it's kind of ironic because the original planners was, hey, let's have a big air battle. And now Portal, uh, that's part of the, the extended quote there that you um, didn't really go right, into. Right. Portal is saying, oh, well, it's, a long, it's a long document. <laughs> what is it? No, now you're telling me that's a, that's an argument against it. It's it's mm -hmm. they don't want to do it. I think I think um, that's the main thing, and they're going to throw anything they can against the wall. I think a lot of it because they don't want to do it. That's the that's okay. the short answer. Okay, so let's start going to questions. We got four ready. So, oh uh, yeah, start in order. Uh, Mike, on mute, and let's since we have so many people, maybe let's try and be a little concise with the questions. Anyway, okay, go, Mike. Well, that's conciseness is going to be tough in this case. Um, well, first of all. Let's take it one step at a time. First of all, as far as Eisenhower's quote, you, you um, at the beginning, you have to realize that Eisenhower um, did say, was of the belief that um, a, um, an invasion of the cross-channel invasion wouldn't have been possible until 1944. He also said in that quote that it would, um, to um, help out the Russians, would take an air campaign first, <clears throat> followed by a ground campaign. Okay, that aside, also we have the, as far as helping the Russians, um, the, the fact is that <clears throat> if the Germans um, um, denuded the Russian front and sent units from the Russian front over to the sledgehammer front, of course, that could have spelled disaster for the sledgehammer front, not necessarily at the landings, but subsequently and certainly with any attempt to break out. If they didn't take units away and therefore didn't uh, have the capacity to crush the sledgehammer front, then Stalin, I mean, Stalin wasn't interested in gestures. He wanted um, a mitigation of the German fighting capacity on his front. He wanted units withdrawn. So one way or the other, it was problematic. As far as the, um, um, well, this is a, the main point I wanted to bring up. The idea is that there had been no daylight precision bombing campaign. And I'm, I'm you don't even start an argument with me about the uh, air campaign because I have specific, uh, I have a lot of specific information about that. Okay, that's something I have done a study of. But um, going on the assumption that spear just taking the Germans at face value, which I don't think is the correct thing to do, but will play in your ballpark because you want to assume that the Germans 
you know, their increase in production. There were no lies, no distortion, even though it was a Nazi regime, that there was no distortion of the uh, figures or the facts or the statistics. But if they increased their capacity to that degree while they were being bombed and with the results of bombing, without the results or with a far, far more limited result of bombing or far more limited bombing, what makes you think that in the period between the landings in Sledgehammer, at Sledgehammer, and the supposed breakout, and I'm sure everybody else can talk about the, uh, the capacity to block that breakout, but in that period that Germany couldn't have gone to total war and that German production would have increased enough, they already had Mark IVs and the Mark IV was well into production, they were starting, they were beginning, they were almost at the cusp of starting to uh, develop Panthers. And as far as uh, just manpower itself, what makes you think that in those few months, or several months, I should say, that the Germans could not have reacted, built up their industrial capacity, unimpeded by any um, allied bombing campaign, and built up their manpower, and stop this thing and crushed it cold while still maintaining the effort on the Russian front. And by the way, one other thing, um, before you start trying to get into Alan Brooke's head, I should say that I know people who knew Alan Brooke and, or I knew people who knew Alan Brooke, they're all dead now, but, um, and I don't think your assessment of Alan Brooke's reasoning makes any sense, but anyway, uh, the predominant question is, what happens if the Germans do react and do go to total war or something approaching it and do increase their uh, um, industrial capacity at, at rates greater than what they did from 1943 on? And remember also that it wasn't until the daylight precision bombing of Germany started underway in Germany that Germany um, made its production capacity for aircraft almost exclusively to fighter aircraft. So they still have plenty of bombers to bomb the facilities at Sherberg on an ongoing basis. And even with the um, RAF and limited US AAF air interdiction. So what makes you think that that reaction, um, the, the German, German total war or the German reaction to that wouldn't have been enough to not only crush this entire operation, or at least stop it cold, and also do nothing to satisfy Stalin's demands. Okay, so let's take it first. Um, Molotov, when he's visiting uh, in the spring of 42, he goes on a diplomatic mission to the US and first to Britain, then to the US and back to Britain. And he specifically says that a second front issue is mainly political. In other words, it's showing that you're trying to help us. Okay, yeah, they wanted to have as much of a military help as they can get. And they're asking for something which I will admit they can't possibly do, which is to take 40 divisions off the Eastern Front, okay? Uh, but he does say the primary purpose of this is political, okay? Uh, they do, uh, Roosevelt gets him to agree, he reluctantly agrees to taking a cutback in uh, Lend-Lease uh, in order to support a second front because uh, Roosevelt still is trying to make him believe that they can do that, okay? He, and, you know, Molotov is like, well, what if we agree to a cutback in supplies and then we don't get the second front. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> they, got, they did get a cut back in supplies and they didn't get their second front. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, it's political. And I, I, it's, just, it's so hard for people to break out of the 1944 mentality. It's not 1944, it's 42. The political parameters are different. All we have to do, uh, minimal, Yes, we want to have a breakout, and I think that's totally viable. We can talk about that some more, but I'm, you know, there's only so many, so much time I want to take on answering each individual uh, question. But 
The minimum they have to do is show that they helped, that they helped. And there's going to be, no matter what happens, if you look at the balance of forces, the correlation of forces, to use the Soviet term, it's just so weighted in the, in the Soviets' favor by late in 42. They're going to have some sort of counterattack, and it's going, to, it's going to succeed on some level. It's just a question of how much. And my, my, what I'm maintaining is by keeping those 17 divisions in the West, without bringing one extra division back, that that in itself, you saw what happened with all with most of those divisions going there, Sixth Panzer, Seventh Panzer, First, Second, and Third SS divisions, Fifteenth uh, Infantry Division, and then a bunch of three hundred divisions, which weren't that great, but they held down line parts of the line that had to be held down. Okay, if you just keep those there, or even if they somehow drive you back in, which I don't see that happening, but if they do. If you've worn them down so much that they go back, they can't, they have to rebuild or they go back at minimum capability. That's a victory. Or just bringing back, there's so many levels that this could be a victory for the, um, for the Western allies because it's really a battle of the narrative, in my opinion. It's a political question. Those are the most important ones. Um, when you say that somehow they're, they're already trying to build up their industry as fast as possible. They realize at the beginning, end of 41, beginning of 42, that they're in big trouble. And that's when they start doing mobilizing their industry. They, it just takes time. You can't just say, oh, I want to build more tanks. You don't go to a vending machine and build tanks. You've got to set up the supply chain. You've got to allocate the resources. You've got to have the manpower. They're trying as fast as they can. There's no possibility in my mind that that could be, incre that could be increased on a substantial basis. Joe's putting his thumbs up. So hopefully, I guess that means he agrees with me. Okay, so I don't really think that's practical. So anyway, I, I think I've answered a few of your questions. So let's go on. <laughs> I know Brandon's been waiting for a while. So Brandon, you go on mute. Okay. Um, so well, let's pick up with, with that last thing about time lags. Yeah. Um, you know, the whole idea of, of uh, Sledgehammer in October or whatever, uh, at that point, um, nobody knew about Stalingrad. In fact, the German army still looked pretty undefeatable in some ways. Uh, there hadn't been that many setbacks. But um, so some of the assumptions you are making are post-war assumptions um, that, OK, if they had invaded in October, then uh, the Germans would have been weakened by Stalingrad and then the Germans would have collapsed or something like that. Well, yeah, I agree with that. And I also, let me be the first to say, I don't know if Sledgehammer would have succeeded or not. I'm not arguing that. I'm arguing with your, sl with your slide that says, because I don't think you're doing history right, in my opinion. Your, sli your slide that says there's no difference in the uh, allied armies between basically when Sledgehammer would have been and when. Uh, Normandy would have been. I just want to read you some quotes that I've got from um, other historians. Um, uh, Carlo Dasti, um, the torch landings in North Africa, Husky invasion of Sicily in July 43 provided unmistakable um, evidence of just how much the Allies had yet to learn about amphibious and airborne operations. Um, uh, fortunately, the lessons of North Africa, Sicily, and Salerno were not lost on the new overlord commanders. Um, Churchill himself was, uh, he, he basically was haunted by Operation Shingle, what happened at Anzio, and brought it up frequently in the Overlord planning. He didn't want to repeat those mistakes again. What kind of mistakes did they make? Well, the British were, one British beach was 10 miles away from the American beach. The Germans drove in between. These are things they learned not to do by 1944, which they might have done or uh, variations of it would, would have happened. Um, there's, there's a lot of other things. Uh, Salerno invasion resulted in the, yeah, okay, so this is the 10 miles. The Green U.S. Uh, 36th Division uh, was counterattacked by several of Kessel Ring's battle-hardened panzer units, which nearly succeeded in driving the Americans back into the sea and might have, um, and might have done and might have done, but for an emergency drop by the 82nd Airborne and direct naval gunfire. Um, 
and, and this is the thing. We talked about Casserine last time. Um, by the way, if you want to throw Rick Atkinson under the bus on Casserine, go back to Martin Blumenson and half a dozen other people. Um, Sabib approves nothing. When you're on the defense, it's not the same as when you are the one attacking. Um, and besides that, City Bouzy before it and what happened afterwards were unmitigated routes. As a matter of fact, when people in Frieden Hall's headquarters said they weren't retreating, they were just adjusting, the, the guy, uh, the colonel on the spot said to him, I know panic when I see it. And this is exactly what might have been encountered. Um, also, uh, other things. Um, okay, so by, just let's talk about Sicily for a second. Um, first of all, there was, after Sicily, there was the, uh, we know we can do it again, said Brigadier General uh, Ray McLean of the 45th Division, because we have succeeded. Um, that wouldn't have occurred. The experience of launching a vast amphibious invasion against a hostile shore would be um, invaluable for the invasions yet to come, notably at Normandy. Um, uh, Army divisions blooded, four were blooded in Sicily to add to the four that were blooded in uh, North Africa. They would have been going in green. Um, uh, all right. I, I get the, I, I know a lot of what you're talking about, okay? Now you well, can... no, let me say one more thing before okay. you go on, because this is important. In Sicily, 50K Germans, 50,000 Germans, overcame Allied air and sea supremacy, so they could land anywhere. And the collapse of the Italian allies that were with them to hold off 500,000 Anglo-Americans for five weeks and then got out in virtually. They had to leave behind some equipment and obviously ammunition and stuff. But the point being is you are talking about a difference in quality. And if you think about the Soviet army in 42 versus 44, uh, talk to David Glantz, don't talk to Brandon Musler. There's a huge difference. So too, allied cooperation between the, the nations, but also um, learning interagency, learning combined arms operations. We simply weren't good at that yet. And American air power was devastating in Normandy. It wasn't before that in Italy. And I could go on and on, but that's enough. Okay. So again, I'm, I'm inclined to believe Rommel over all those historians. And he talked about air power as well, didn't he? Uh, you, you brought up the 36th Division. Well, that's probably... Who, uh, we had that long quote from the British intelligence officer. I'm pretty sure he's talking about the 36th uh, uh, Infantry Division and just how bad they were. So to say that they almost drove them back is the same as saying they didn't drive them back. And why didn't you? You mentioned the reason, the same reason I came up with, which is firepower. In this case, naval firepower. They, the Allies were good with their firepower from the beginning. It's the, it's the decisive defensive weapon of World War II is artillery, okay? Um, yes, if they had to take on some of these better uh, German divisions in open warfare in 1942, I think the Germans would have run rings around them, but that's not what they're doing. They're gonna, they're gonna basically crush this one poorly deployed and not very good division on the on the peninsula, potentially. You don't know what's really going to happen because it's counterfactual. I actually, you know, I don't I don't want to actually say that I would say that it would work because I don't really know. I'm just giving you reasons why it might have worked. And basically I really want to shoot down these myths. And one of the myths that you that these historians have perpetuated is that this is great renaissance. And I don't see it. Show me that from don't show me their conclusions, show me individual actions or a series of actions in Normandy in the opening days where allied forces are showing that they've learned lessons from earlier battles. And I don't see them. I don't see it. I'm not saying there are none, but I can give you a billion, I can give you many, many uh, examples where the opposite is shown, the frontal assaults, uh, just like at City Bouzid, third uh, armor division, first time in, 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 um, in action, it's, did exactly the same as Alger at City Bouzid. They straight on right into the into the opposing, with no infantry support, no artillery support. The only difference is they didn't have the fields of fire there. Otherwise, they probably would have lost as bad as Al Al Alger at City Bouzid. By the way, that's one battalion going against probably the two best equipped 
German panzer divisions in the German army at that time. So what do you expect? Of course, it's going to be a wipeout. No, it's not, Frank. Those are the two best equipped uh, German panzer divisions in February of 1942. Can I, can I just give you army. one quote from Albert Kessering, who happens to be Rommel's boss? Smiling <laughs> Al said, without the Mediterranean experience, um, Normandy would have undoubtedly become a failure. In other words, well, that opinion. counters Rommel. I mean, Rommel's I mean, Rommel's problem was always his lack of logistics. back in Italy. So, I mean, Kesselring's a good guy. I just, show me the evidence. Show For me two the and evidence. a half years. So it's the evidence would, after ev the evidence. The evidence is in good, Italy, so. which is where we were, where we were tied okay. down forces. So, let's see. So you mentioned, <laughs> let's see, where else did you? Um, okay, I think I, I okay. So he, does, he mentioned this. I want to bring experts into it. There was, uh, uh, if you read the Battle in the Hedgerows and other sources, he, he did a specific study on, uh, American fighting in Hedros and Normandy. He specifically says that the, all the lessons of Tunisia and, and Italy and Sicily had to be relearned at a frightful cost in Normandy. In other words, they didn't learn the lessons. Okay. So anyway, it's a difference of opinion. Um, well, let's go I just to feel like they have an opportunity to crush the weak division. Then they get into defensive position. It's an easier type of battle. Like you said, it is a then it is a defensive battle to, to hold off the reserves uh, uh, from that point on, in which case they can bring their firepower, both organic and naval, into uh, into play. Okay. Well, that's what I, I, can I guarantee they would succeed? No, but I just see that there's a there's every reason to believe that they would have. Okay. Okay, so nice. go, go, Vincent. <laughs> well, I, I, there's no question that, that experienced divisions are better than green divisions. I mean, the question is, would the green divisions have been annihilated by, by some experienced and some unexperienced German divisions? It's kind of, it's kind of like an endless loop. As far as, far as um, Alan Brooke is concerned, or General Brooke, you read his comments right on the night of June 5th, 1944, and he was terrified about what was going to happen in Normandy. So I, I think it's pretty safe to say that he was not a, a fountain of optimism in any sort of operations in that regard. My question is is much more specific. You you spent a lot of time talking about the coasters and the wonderful impact they would have had upon Allied supply efforts, and I'm and I know that they served a function in the British economy at the time. Have you looked into that at all, Gary? I mean, what would the British have lost by taking all these coasters and devoting them to Sledgehammer? What, what were the downstream implications of that? Well, there are downstream implications, and that's true. But uh, since it was a smaller scale operation, they're going to be using less of the coaster fleet, almost certainly in 1942, through to 43 as they did 44, 45. But there were, uh, now one of the implications was uh, that a lot of them were colliers basically, they, they hauled coal. So it's gonna be a cold winter for a lot of people, but it's more than that, they do haul, haul, haul coking coal as well. And um, it did have an impact in 1944, 45 in the, in the, to the extent that some of the, um, um, some smaller steel, um, making uh, operations had to shut down because of lack of coal. But I mean, if they survived it in 40, 44, 45, I don't, uh, using a lesser number in earlier, I think would have a less of an impact. And as we already saw uh, from that quote, they had a large surplus of uh, armaments production in Great Britain. So I don't think a, a marginal drop off um, and that would make a huge difference, but you're right. It would have a uh, an economic impact, no question. I, I would like to make one, one other comment and then I'll, I'll shut up is, you know, I, I focus on naval history, obviously. And, and when I read about how the Germans had to budget fuel supplies in order to um, pull off any sort of naval operation in 1942, even at the destroyer level, and we won't even talk about what the Italians were suffering in the Mediterranean at that time. And the fact that they were pretty much dependent upon German uh, supplies in order to put anything larger than a cruiser to sea. I, I, I um, 
you know, the, the idea of the Germans being able to sustain a, a large scale air offensive against Cherbourg in the late 1940s, it just seems incredible to me. You know, it's, the fuel's got to come from somewhere. It's just not there. So the fuel stocks for aviation gas were the lowest in October of 1942, September, October, than they've been since uh, June of 1940. And they would not fall again that low until September of 44. So in other words, after the breakup. Actually, the fuel position of the German army on the eve of D-Day uh, in 1944 was the best it had been since before uh, Barbarossa. Uh, 50 percent more uh, motor fuel and a lot more aviation fuel, even though they're flying around a lot more, which shows they're doing a lot more. So the fuel situation so much more favors the allies in uh, 1942. Uh, it's a transient thing. Uh, it doesn't last forever, but it's a window of opportunity. Yeah. So, you, Greg, we have Greg. Now. All right, Greg. right. Hello, can you hear me? Right. Well, I've long since forgotten my question, but I've been very <laughs> interested by some of the comments you've been um, making here. Uh, just first of all, we'll say Gary is absolutely right. We should have been able to invade in 1942. It's absolutely ridiculous that we couldn't do it then. There are lots of reasons why we couldn't. And a lot of those reasons are because a lot of people, as Gary says, didn't want it to happen. Um, the whole things like things like the Spitfire issue not having range was absolutely ridiculous. There's no problem with Spitfire range. And this, there are loads of myths like this floating around. But some of the other things I've heard are sort of fascinating to me. This idea that we had to have a bomber offensive before we could um, go ahead. And this is absolute nonsense. Um, everything we'd learned all our lessons by D-Day. I mean, have you forgotten what happened with close air support on the first day of D-Day? It was an absolute catastrophe. It was actually worse than Dieppe. We went backwards in that respect. So phew, the thing about 1942, though, if you wanted um, sledgehammer in 1942, it had to be a British operation. The Americans just weren't going to arrive in time. It had to be in the summer and it had to be uh, a British operation. And we were up for it between what? September 41 and, and March 42. Churchill wanted to go that way. But then the bomber mafia intervened and they managed to persuade everybody that we had to go on and bomb Germany before we did anything else, which, of course, turned out to be total rubbish. But by 1944, the Germans were actually stronger than they were in 1942. I could go on, but um, Gary's right that it was it should have been possible. Um, but there are an awful lot of people who are putting obstacles in the way basically because they wanted to give the bomber offensive a chance to win the war before the armies could win the war. But that's my view on it. Sorry, there's not a question there. Just a bit of a... Certainly Gary can comment about it. what you just said, yeah. Yeah, your check's in the mail. No, I'm kidding. Um, I, I do want to say one thing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm being strongly advocate in a certain way because I'm pushing back against a certain narrative. But I do want to give a different perspective uh, I think um, Roosevelt himself was tempted uh, with the, the siren call of the bomber offensive, uh, maybe the American version more so than the British, but one way or another. But if you think about it, if you think about it from their standpoint, they really believe this is going to work. And if it does work, it's actually great, isn't it? It does save the invasion from going forward. So I'm going to argue on Brooks' side a little bit here. It's like he really thinks this thing's going to be a disaster. I don't want to do it. Plus, we got this. It looks like this other thing might work. Roosevelt, I believe, is 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 believing the same thing and up all the way through late 43, uh, when he finally, I think, gives it up. And But if they'd been right, then of course you'd want to do it that way. And uh, it's easy for me, in retrospect, to say it was wrong. I, I, but, but the thing is, I don't really want to get into this whole issue of the wisdom or the of individual leaders, where they made a mistake or not. It's to me, it's a strategic study. It's a way, it's a war game to go back and look at what might have been done better or differently so that we can learn from that. Okay. Um, you know, people talk about Monday morning cat quarterbacking. Well, that's what quarterbacks do on Monday morning themselves. They go back <laughs> and look at the film, even when they win the game, they want to see what they could have done better. And that's basically what I'm saying here. I, you have to admit that the strategy that unfolded, and I didn't even really go into the, the disastrous logistical problems it caused in uh, Britain 
uh, in uh, the torch did because the, because of the the loss of imports that they suffered in the months go, uh, following torch. They basically torch basically almost. A, a, did more to jeopardize the German, uh, the British war effort in a few months than the uh, U-boats had in three years. Wow. It, it, but really to that, Gary, actually, since I was um, looking over Clay Blair again, um, he actually points out that Torch diverted a lot of U-boats from the north, you know, the mid-Atlantic for several weeks. And that actually, there was a kind of, you know, lessening of the pressure on the con on the cross Atlantic convoys that, you know, he points to and considers that a mistake that they, you know, cause they didn't actually do that much damage to the transports or to, to torch essentially. So, okay, so a couple of things, first of all, any submarine that went into the Mediterranean, it was a one way trip. They could not get out. Okay. So um, that's kind of a loss to it. But the other thing is, if you, uh, uh, I didn't really go into the naval appreciation, I already touched upon it, but the German Navy had appreciated that if there was an invasion in Normandy, um, specifically that that was gonna be a diversion and to set up um, uh, destruction of the U-boat base. I, I did touch on that briefly, but their plan in that case was then to rotate their, do the same thing, except they're gonna go and try to protect their bases in Brittany. Okay, which actually brings them in inside the strongest uh, anti-submarine defense uh, range of anti-submarine uh, defenses anywhere in the world, including including um, uh, air uh, anti-submarine air power. Which by that time, by the way, they already were starting to put in the centimetric wave radar, which the Germans could not uh, detect. So they were going to pull their submarines off the North Atlantic route anyway and actually bring them in, in an area where they, a lot of them could be destroyed potentially and uh, to get guard against an invasion that wasn't gonna happen. So they could have got much of that uh, benefit anyway. Plus, obviously you wouldn't have the diminution of the, uh, of the, uh, of the allied anti-submarine force, their surface forces, which you had. Uh, mm -hmm. The Jeep carriers could have got started there. Actually, the first one went forward in like September of 1942, but then had to be called back to uh, HMS Archer, I think it is, to go and get ready for torch. And so then it's torch thing, and then it got sunk on the way back. And there's four Jeep carriers taking fighters to Morocco. Those could have been working up to get uh, going in the U-boat war, but instead they're on this uh, errand to, to torch. And by the way, all those planes stayed in Morocco and didn't even come in contact with the Germans for many, many months, okay? Mm -hmm. Because there wasn't logistics to support them in Tunisia. Uh, 21 brand new uh, B-24s came off the assembly lines, got the latest centimetric ASV radar in, right about that time. There's only six of those planes in Iceland at the time. But where did the 21 new planes, anti-submarine planes, the very long range that everyone says were so crucial to winning the Battle of the Atlantic, where did they go? They went to Morocco, where again, they didn't need to, they could have gone to Iceland. So that would have been, already in September, Donuts is saying that he cannot sustain the losses that he's taking, okay? <laughs> and basically the allies give him new life by dividing their anti-submarine forces. Okay, well, let's go to Frank next. Frank, you want to mute? Frank? Or, well, we're waiting for Frank. Uh, let's go to Mark first. Uh, so, unmute Mark. And, yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Gary. Um, this is interesting. Uh, I'm not sure I completely agree, but it, it's, it's certainly in, in, uh, a good intellectual ex exercise. Uh, two two uh, questions, uh, one quick one, one, and then another longer one. You, the graph you showed with the fuel for the Seventh Panzer was really low until November, and then it spiked up in November '42. Mm -hmm. Why did that happen? And uh, the second question is about the air power. I looked up the air losses for Dieppe, and the Allies or the British basically lost about 100 aircraft. The Germans, uh, 48 aircraft. So it was a two to one loss. Are you think are you assuming that, or is are you assuming a better performance with Sledgehammer? Um, I'm, first of all, they could easily sustain. They they had much more resources. Okay, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, when yeah. you do the numbers game, I guess the Germans won on the Eastern Front because they locked up a lot more losses, losses there. No, the Allies can sustain higher losses, but True. Um, uh, potentially as many as 40% of the of, uh, Allied losses at Dieppe were from ground fire, okay? Uh, because there was heavy anti-aircraft and the plan had, uh, for Dieppe, the air plan, had required that all fighters go overland above Dieppe for whatever reason. I'm pretty sure after day two, they would have figured that out, but it doesn't matter because at uh, Madeline Beach, there were zero anti-aircraft guns. So, so even if it wasn't 40%, even if it was only 25%, that lessens the difference there. But the other thing is there's two other factors. Uh, one, there's fewer and less high quality by a margin uh, extent, uh, fighters uh, at Dieppe as there would have been at Sledgehammer. Plus, if you if you look at it actually on, as a function of missions flown, then the difference goes away a uh, number of sorties, uh, losses as a percentage of sorties, and the, the, the difference even is less, and maybe even flips to the Allies' favor. And on top of that, uh, at least according to the testimony of some of the fighter pilots that were there, like Broadhurst, uh, the, fire, the Germans were still in their uh, opportunistic mode, okay? They would only attack when they had, um, you know, the advantage, okay? And, uh, of course, because that's their, that's their mode of thinking up to that point. They're not going to, you know, in, in just a matter of a couple of hours, they're not necessarily going to change their, their way of, of approaching this. But if you're having your... Um, airfield bombed into smithereens, that's a different thing. <laughs> you either got to retreat, in which case you're out of the battle, or you got to protect your, your airfield and you can't always wait till you have the best tactical advantage. So that's going to eliminate that as well. So there, uh, I think that hopefully that answers your question. And the, uh, the fuel thing, why did that spike in November? You know, I really don't know. I just think truthfully, I think, um, I don't really see in the documents saying why, um, like, oh, now we have more, but, but, but they did. Uh, and so that is a window of opportunity. I mean, and, and I'm, not, I'm not making the argument necessarily that they would have ran out of fuel. It's, it's gonna be, obviously there is, there's gotta be some reserves here and there. They don't wanna dole them out and you can see it all through the documents. They're really cutting back at this point in time, but the question is, is it is kind of a one of a nail type thing. You see that in various operations like at Salerno and stuff where this unit or that unit can't engage because they're waiting for the fuel to come. And that's the kind of thing you're, you're, you're likely to see. I, I don't really think it's gonna necessarily have a strategic difference, but and tactically and sometimes operationally it might be significant. Uh, and all I can say is the fuel situation was far more dire in October of 42 than it was any time subsequent to that, uh, let's say picking it up in early 43, up through probably at least August to September of 44. In other words, after uh, the breakout in Normandy, so. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I, think I'd I think everybody would like to hear what Joe uh, <laughs> would have to, has to say about this, because of course he kind of yeah, started <laughs> some yeah, of this with his dissertation. <laughs> So you you go, Joe. Okay, am I? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll I'll be fairly brief. Um, a lot of my comments would be um, if I was like a general editor going forward, you know, just things that impress me or things that we would want to for a while. First of all, I'm impressed with Gary's statistics about shipping versus sledgehammer versus torch. I, I think that's very, very impressive, very well done. Um, the next one was the map where he showed us about the, the, the three German Panzer divisions and then the two SS divisions in the map. I, I drooled when he put that map up there. It strikes me that these are the only reserves that the Germans are gonna have in France to throw against sledgehammer. The rest of the divisions are just gonna be sitting along the coast they're not going to be movable, and the and I'm not sure that they're going to be enough to do the job to throw the Allies out of the peninsula. Uh, the, my next comment is about this fuel shortage. 
Um, I think this fuel shortage is very, very important on the German side and would really, really uh, bear further research and investigation. Um, I give Gary uh, applause for the Rommel quotes on the Pazarine cast. My only caution there would be that Rommel could have been just trying to cover his ass a little bit there, but uh, but nevertheless, uh, the now my next observation would be the the statistics about the sledgehammer opportunity east and west, and it shows 17 German uh, divisions transferred west to east in the winter and the spring, and then six German answer you know, the six and so forth. Uh, and then March 1943, six of the eight infantry divisions and five of the 10 Mecker armor divisions were transferred from France. I would be very careful of, and I would want to look at this because that that could have been gone the other way. You know, so I would I would ask that question, you know, could this have been transferred in the other direction and with what impact? Uh, okay, let's see. All right. Now, the comment about the 17 miles at the base versus 100 kilometers in the Allenbrook quote, I think we have apples and oranges here. I think the, I think the Allenbrook 100 kilometer quote was referring to an expanded bridgehead, more like what the Allies actually achieved by the middle of July 1944. I really think that's what he's referring to. He's not referring to the neck of the uh, peninsula there. Uh, Okay, here's the other thing. If the Allies land here, and let's say after two weeks, it's a relatively successful operation and they've secured the uh, peninsula. And now Stalingrad happens. Well, the Allies, uh, the British and the Americans are gonna do a reassessment here on what their possibilities are in France. And if there's no more German divisions coming to France from Russia, and I don't see how there possibly could have been, you know, there might have been some possibilities here. The Allies would be scratching their head and saying, I wonder what we can do. Okay, carpet bombing. Uh, here's another thing I, I don't really know, but it's my impression that we did some minor carpet bombing operations in Tunisia in the spring of 1943, but I'm not sure about that. And I would want to, I would want to look at that. Okay, uh, Mike made a comment about German production of tanks and whether the Germans could have suddenly ramped up their tank production in the fall and early winter of 43. It's my impression that the lull in German tank production was a result of them tooling over to the production of Panther and Tiger tanks, and that prevented the production of Mark IVs. And I'm not sure if the Germans could have just switched to you know, snapped their finger and, and all of a sudden ramped up Mark IV production. I, I think they were in the middle of a retooling thing there. Okay. Uh, okay. In the longer term, when it comes to the spring and the summer of 1943, what if Hitler diverts his Kursk resources to France? In other words, we know that they were able to mount a serious uh, offensive there in Kursk, and, and we, we all know why it didn't work. The, the Russians were ready, three defensive belts you know, hundreds of tanks and all that. But what if some of those resources would have been diverted west? Now, that, that's the summer of 1943. Let's see, okay. And uh, let, Okay, another thing is this lessons learned from Torch and Salerno and Sicily were not lost on Eisenhower and he used them to good effect for Overlord. And that quote was used to slam dunk Sledgehammer. I think that's a little spurious because I think a lot of the lessons that are cited that they learned from Torch and Salerno and so forth were actually applicable to Overlord and were not necessarily applicable to Sledgehammer. So I, and, uh, and the, I got just two more here and then I'm done. Uh, the, the panic at Kazarine, uh, I, I, I need to go back and really look at what happened in those early battles in uh, Tunisia around Kasserine Pass. Uh, now, on the other hand, it's my impression that the Panzer attack at Kasserine caught us by surprise. I don't think any such Panzer attack in Sledgehammer would have caught us by surprise. I think we had very good intelligence there. 
you know, reconnaissance planes flying over every acre of ground, uh, any Panzer division would have been detected and coming. And I don't think anything would have been caught by surprise in Sledgehammer. Uh, and finally, I'm, I'm impressed by Vincent's comments on the low fuel shortage with German naval operations and just Italian ships. And again, I, want, I come back to this fuel. If the Germans did not have the fuel in France in October and November of 1942, then I don't see how they could have launched a successful counterattack against Sledgehammer. Okay. That's it. Th thanks for your patience. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, and you literally, you're seeing in the documents, they're literally saying we are taking fuel from France and sending it to the Eastern Front, okay? Because they're running out there. <laughs> So um, that's, that's the reason why. And I, probably the reason why there's this boost up is it's at some point, you know, operations are running down even on the Eastern Front. And they're able to accumulate a little bit of reserve. But if you have a campaign in the West, that pushes all that to the right on the timeline, right? You're having to burn up a lot of fuel just to redeploy your forces and thus and such, okay? Um, plus there's always the thing you've got to keep in your mind that they can't be sure that this is the real deal. So why am I gonna send all of my, my reserves right away to this one place when I'm not even sure, uh, you know, uh, Rundstedt says from the very beginning, all the way through and through past Overlord, his biggest worry was uh, a, wor a, a, a landing at the mouth of the Somme and then they would drive straight on the Ruhr and game over, right? Well, is he going to take, he's only got one mobile division, assuming that the first SS goes to Normandy, which I'm 99.9% .9 sure it would. He's only got one division to, 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 to stop that, and that's 10th Panzer. Is he going to just right away send 10th Panzer from Amiens to, uh, that, that's the only mobile division. He's got that whole, from Normandy all the way up through the Netherlands. He, he's got to stop and think about it for a while. And uh, I think Hitler is going to be the same way based on his characteristics. Uh, as far as the uh, Brook quote, uh, it's not in the plan to advance off the peninsula. So why is he bringing it up? He's bringing it up because he's trying to make Marshall look bad because he says, oh, it'll take 10 divisions and the Americans can only give us three. Okay, well, they have three by the end of August. And it says in the plan, in this, that supposedly you should be reading, that they're going to be bringing in two divisions a month. Well, they don't bring in two divisions a month because there's no reason to after July because it's all going to Tunisia. They only bring in one division, which, by the way, is the 29th Infantry Division that has 20 months to prepare for D-Day. And if you look at their performance after you get off Omaha Beach... I'm not, you know, mm. casting shade. They have a lot of problems because they, they haven't learned any lessons. That's the problem. Um, so, yes, but even if they do, even if he is talking about something later on, I'm talking, going back to Brooke. Uh, by that time, the Americans will have more than three divisions. They have three divisions by the middle of October. Obviously, they can bring some more over by landing ship, just like they did for Torch, right? They don't necessarily have to land on D-Day, but they get to land on D plus one, right? After the beaches are secured, all those guys had to come 4,500 miles. Why can't they come 2,800 miles or whatever it is from uh, the East Coast to uh, to the, the English Channel and land on D plus one or D plus two, right? And um, and that brings more troops into the theater. So the, the idea that the, he's trying to make Marshall look bad, he's like, oh, he's, he wants us to do this and all the burden is gonna be on us. And it's just, it's not really, I don't, I don't really buy that. Um, what else? Um, I think there was something, oh yes, Catherine Pass. Okay, again, they've got 200 miles. It's the general ship is so much more difficult when you, you're going up against like, where are they going to come? Are they going to come in this pass? Or are they going to come in that pass? Are they going to come here or there? Okay, you're, if you have a 17 or 20 or 22 mile front and you're facing south, you know they can't go around your, your flank to the right. It's, it's like, in, in a sense, it's geography like at El Alamein. You've got the guitar protection on one side and you've got the Mediterranean on the other. Well, in the peninsula, you've got ocean on both sides, right? And they only can come in one direction, right at you. 
Uh, so uh, you're, from a generalship standpoint, it's much easier. I just got to put firepower on those guys as they come out of their, their positions and the, they expose themselves and hope my guys have a little bit of moxie to hold out, which I think they, so they showed even at Castorine Pass. They did not melt at first contact with the enemy. Uh, it was a mixed bag, a grab bag of guys. Uh, it was not uh, units fighting, big units fighting as units. Some of them weren't uh, really combat troops. And they still held back for the better part of two days. So I just feel like um, uh, that is not a true test of, of what, you know, uh, the Americans could do even then, and even and, and under the considerate under circumstances, I think they actually put up a pretty good showing. Okay, let's look, go with uh, Frank next. Uh, was a good good uh, background, Frank, and appropriate. <laughs> I like it, Frank. Yeah, it's supposed, it's supposed to be really intimidating, right? <laughs> um, uh, I'm looking at the wet bulb uh, article. I mean the uh, uh, operations order, mm -hmm. and I'm seeing. Two tank battalions in Churchill's. Um, I think if you're doing snapshot sort of history and you're saying that's what they were then, um, and then altering the fact that there was no torch and saying, well, that that snapshot is what they would have been at that point without torch, is, I mean, it's a bit of a leisure demand, you know. Um, but that's all right. Let that go. Uh, what I think has to be understood is big picture and who's making the real decisions here. It's Adolf. Adolf's making the big decisions, not anybody else. Okay. Well, he is, he's already deployed for sledgehammer. He's already sent the first, second SS and he's asking the third to go. He sent gross Deutschland was supposed to go. If you read the directives, you'll understand why, but it ended up in the reserve stallion. Okay, it was supposed to go. Now, had there been a buildup for some kind of cross-channel uh, event, right, they would have known that, the Germans. And so he had in country 6th, 7th, 10th Panzer, plus these three other divisions. Uh, I find it very difficult to, to assess anything but at least a stagnant front on the continent peninsula and with just two tank battalions of Churchill's in the first few days, plus it says Sherbrooke taken within six days, not the three you're talking about, it's talking about six days. I find it very difficult to believe that anything but a complete colossal defeat would be the final outcome. However, even if it isn't, even if it isn't, those divisions are there. So when you're looking at <clears throat> your Uranus and, and Saturn, okay, the actual operations that took place around Stalingrad, that 20 kilometers, that's very critical. They nearly made it, the Russians. They really, they nearly defeated practically 80 divisions. Not that the what they did at Stalingrad was consequential, but this would have been the utter defeat of the, the German Wehrmacht. Now, yeah. if Sledgehammer had, had have gone off, yes, I believe that that 20 kilometers would have been taken. But you would have had essentially a Salonika where you've got these divisions stuck in the continent peninsula being attrited very quickly, but nevertheless reinforced. It says they can take 26,000 a week in reinforcement. No, I'm not getting anything more than that from this, from this operations order. So, you know, you're packing troops into there. And meanwhile, the Russian army is steamrolling over Europe. Now this was sort of explained to Churchill when he went to, to Moscow in August, that this is what the plan was. Uh, not that there was a plan of um, uh, encirclements or how it was put was it around about Novosersk, which is on the Black Sea, 
there was going to be a breakout from there. Um, and he showed he was showing the um, the defenses along the Taurus Mountains that already were in place, which was sort of a surprise to him. And Alan Brook didn't believe it. Okay, he didn't really believe that this was going to this was going to happen based on what he saw when he flew over. But it did happen. So, um, what's what really needs to be understood is that from the German generalship point of view, uh, the way their their army is being uh, taken apart by Hitler more than anybody else is of concern, right, to them at this point. You've got a salient, the Reserve salient is full of 10 Panzer divisions, okay? 10 Panzer divisions. It made no sense to them. Why didn't they just cut the base of the salient off and just defend that? Why is it that Zeisler was asking for seven Panzer divisions to, re to relieve Stalingrad? And yet he was only given one, and that was the sixth Panzer. Okay, well, you had the 23rd and the 17th already right. there. The 23rd, was they held back the 17th. But the yeah, let me finish. Was, yeah. yeah, I know. The 23rd wasn't very good. 17th Panzer wasn't bad. They were asking for seven, but it would have meant taking them from the southern push to, towards Grozny. This made sense. But Hitler refused to give them that go ahead. So none of this is making sense. Why are there 10 Panzer divisions to include the Gross Deutschland stuck in the Reserve Salient? So I'm asking you, what would you do? If you were a general at that level, what would you do? You know, well, the answer is kill Adolf Hitler. And that's what they tried to do. OK, they tried to kill him because of his asinine decisions that he was making at this particular point. So you're right in that Sledgehammer would have worked even better because Hitler would have complied with his, his directives that stated that there's going to be an attack in, in July. He would have complied and sent divisions to, to bottle up that, that allied army. And these are the questions that should be really posed here. It's like, why is that? Why is Adolf Hitler doing these decisions? Based on what? Based on reading just newspapers? This, this is where the concern is, because Kluger and von Treskow and people like that we're saying the Adolf Hitler's nuts, all right? He needs to be killed. They couldn't kill him, okay? They couldn't kill him then. That was in January of 43. So all this is, is, is interesting. It's interesting as counterfactual stuff. Uh, and yes, had it worked, had you done Sledgehammer, had the, you know, then Russia, Soviet Union, Stalin, would have absolutely beaten the Wehrmacht at this point and walked through most of Europe. Now, what France would have done at this point and what Italy would have done at this point, we don't know because since there was no torch and there's still a Dalan and there's still a Laval there, whether they would have fought as well alongside the Germans if Hitler had have asked them, but Hitler refused to ask, which is also weird, okay? Now, Benito is not suffering casualties on the, on the level that he will suffer because of Tunisograd, as we pointed out last time, and Sicily. So he's still in the fight. All very interesting and all counterfactual stuff. But you're right. Sledgehammer would have worked. Would have worked even better than... It, it didn't make sense to the Wehrmacht, by the way, OKH OK and OKW, OK to send all these divisions away from Blau and Brunswick. It made no sense because there was no likelihood of this thing taking place because Alan Brook is correct, it made no sense, okay? So they couldn't understand why Hitler's sending these divisions over there, but they, they were sent there. So there's a lot unanswered stuff, and it, 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 it serves a purpose to history to look at these things and start asking the questions, well, you know, this doesn't make sense. Why did this happen? Why are they out of fuel? Why, for instance, is Romania not producing more fuel? It produced more fuel in 38, than it did in this particular period. Why is that? Because Gerstenberg is a guy in charge. Why is Germany not able to get more fuel out of Romania? This makes no sense. And by the way, if you don't do, if you don't do torch, you can't have the attack on Ploesti. So that's another point. 
you know, uh, all these things, they kind of mesh together. Um, from yeah, can you answer some of those things? Well, let me um, ask, just um, okay. hang on, I'll stop. What it seems to me is what was done made sense. It made sense given what actually, yeah, it made sense. Soft butt underbelly made sense. Taken out Italy made sense. Taken out France made sense. Um, and given the, the fact that you've got Singapore plus Tobruk and the lousy operations around Crete, all these things, and plus the existence of you've got the, the Shan horse and the Turpits and the Prince Eugen available. All right. All these things made sense. But you're right. Had Sledgehammer worked and had it been executed, yes, the Allies, i.e. Stalin, would have won. So uh, minor point, uh, the Palestine raid was not a success because they just knocked out a lot of excess of refining capacity. Uh, because like you said, the production went down, but they had, they had enough refineries to refine the oil when the uh, production was higher. So basically they didn't lose anything from that. They, uh, uh, let's see, um, you know, you're right about something else though that you brought up before, which kind of puzzled me at first, but then I figured out what you were saying. And that is uh, part of the backstory to Sledgehammer going back to March is that they gave, the chiefs of staff gave the go ahead in anticipation of maybe doing a uh, sledgehammer, although I don't think Brooke ever wanted to do it really. But they said, okay, we're gonna reopen the ports, you know, because they were blocked as an anti-invasion measure, the Southern ports. And we're going to create a bunch of hards, you know, the ramps they actually end up using for D-Day for to load uh, ships. And, um, and we're going to convert a bunch of Thames River barges into these, uh, put ramps on them and stuff. And I think that's what showed up on the uh, German reconnaissance, okay? So the Germans are seeing all these things. And um, now the three Panzer divisions that already were baked in, they already came back in March. So that had no impact on it. But I think the two SS and eventually the third uh, SS that did come back, uh, at least two out of those three were probably, um, um, brought back because of um, what the information Hitler was get, getting uh, about uh, with respect to the preparations for the sledgehammer, which was never going to go up. But the reopening, the, the, the things that they were doing, okay? So you're right about that. Actually, in a way, it did help. So uh, now 3rd SS came back. He was pretty much whipped to hell. Um, I'm not sure how much good it would have done if he hadn't come. As a matter of fact, even after they'd been back for two and a half months, uh, when uh, Hitler orders all three of them back at the end of December, the commander of, of Totenkopf, the uh, third SS, uh, personally intervenes with Hitler and says, I can't go yet, I'm not ready. So um, he gets a month extension. Um, das Reich could come back fairly early. So it was probably in really good uh, condition by, um, uh, by later on. Uh, now, but you make the point, if they had seen, they already were seeing, that's the thing. Well, there's no magic threshold over which they're going to say, hey, Hitler already believes it's going to happen. So I don't see there's much he would have done differently. He's already trying to get divisions back, like Gross Deutschland. You're right. And I even found another reference where they said, Gross Deutschland's coming, but it doesn't come. He wants to bring it, but he just doesn't, you know, everything is too... Uh, to tightly drawn on the Eastern Front, he can't do it. So they already believe it. Plus they're getting this, the, the false information from the agent, uh, from the double cross committee saying there's gonna be a landing in, in, in uh, Norm in Cherbourg uh, somewhere, near, uh, near Cherbourg somewhere. So he already, believe, I don't believe anything he does um, after, um, you know, the summer is going to be any different, even if they have more of a buildup, because there's, it's just going to be more of the same. He's already expecting it to happen. OK. And if you look at the deployments he's doing, uh, if we got in a little more of a conversation about the what if thing, I really do believe he's going to try to defeat. He's going to solve all of his problems, his dilemmas by trying to defeat the invasion with basically just the first and second SS divisions. And I just don't think that's going to be enough. And by the time he realizes it's not enough. Now they're dug in, they're reinforced. You know, you've got divisions behind divisions and such. So um, 
Uh, let's see, I'm, I'm sure you brought up some other points. Oh, uh, I don't believe there was 80 divisions there on the southern wing. Uh, uh, for instance, 1st Panzer Army, I think, had three SS divisions, as, I mean, three Panzer divisions, SS Viking plus three. So what is that? That's six, that's seven divisions in the 1st Panzer Army, um, 17th Army. But anyway, could uh, have Stalin have rolled all the way? First of all, he doesn't have the trucks that he has later in the war. OK, you're still going to have the Rapusista that's going to stop things in March. Right. So but you're right. That could have happened. That could have happened. And uh, something I really hadn't thought about before. Um, but I think the more likely uh, the more likely thing is, as I think Joe was saying before, at some point in October or by the latest, when the Stalingrad gets uh, surrounded, the uh, allies are going to reassess. They're going to say, hey, we're not just going to hold out here. We're going to try to break out. But then that's going to take some time because they're going to have to build up resources. You know, they're going to have to bring up uh, more troops and more supplies onto the continent. But at some point, they're going to be able to grind it out. I feel like I can't prove it. Uh, I think uh, the Germans will have cooperated up to that point and attributed themselves and trying to drive them out. And they will have been weakened. And now when the uh, allies, you know, fight back. It's going to be some some tough fighting, no question. But I can very much see them breaking out in Jan early January uh, or maybe February, which is when things are really going to hell on the Eastern Front. And if that happens, they just don't have the capacity to rebound like they did in '44 because of the tank production. And yes, Joe was right. As, uh, there is a there isn't really a big dip, but they are converting over from the Mark III to the Panther mostly, uh, and they have a lot of problems with that. And then, as anyone knows, when those Panthers first come out, they get a bunch of them, but they don't work. <laughs> they break down. You know, it took a while to, you know, get the bugs out, which they had by 44. So that's just such an opportune time. Can I prove that it would have all worked out that way? No, but the early 43 period is such an incredibly opportune time for the Allies to take advantage of what's going on on the Eastern Front and what's take, going on in the, in the war economy of Germany that I think it's a, it's a golden opportunity for them. Uh, but, you know, there's so many factors. There's so many things you can't foresee. Maybe it would have worked out the way you uh, feared, um, uh, Frank. And um, I'm glad you brought that up. I have to think about that. <laughs> I don't think it would have, but it's possible. Okay. Well, um, first, um, Ted, Ted and uh, Joe Joyce. Uh, and even though you're late, Ted, yeah, we would love to get questions from you guys. But um, Jim, I think, uh, is up next. So, well, no, let, yeah, let Joe and Ted, if they have want to jump in, but. I want to thank you, Gary, because as you know, I, I still disagree with you, but uh, <laughs> but it was it's always persuasive to listen to your arguments. And frankly, I think Joe I, or uh, 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 Melosi and others, uh, it's only uh, Stoller has mentioned the idea of taking this into a book. Um, and I wanted to just think out loud of some of the questions that come up and maybe others can jump in here. One. Uh, the D.C. France issue to be further flushed out. Hopefully Paxton can come in the mix. The Italian army issue, hopefully to be flushed out. Someone like John Gooch, McGregor Knox, and Brian Sullivan, whoever. Guys like that who could really give us a, a better picture about the Italians. Uh, the only uh, Pacific theater or Asia theater historian we've had come in here so far is, is Ted. We haven't had John Parshall. And I'd really be interested to get their kind of uh, perspective from a global point of view of how all this interacts with the war in Asia. What's their thoughts? Um, then the issue, the fourth issue was, this is where I do disagree with you, the pol political issue. Uh, you know, what are the, uh, you know, let's say they, per Churchill is persuaded, which I don't think he would have been. But then what have been the ramifications politically in England, et cetera, how that would have happened, how that would have evolved. Uh, another thing pops into mind, the, you know, all these questions of production are being talked about. So it'd be interesting to get a real more further down into detail into the weeds uh, answers to questions like the fuel issue, like the question of naval uh, strength could have been shifted, could have been that back and forth. Uh, another question comes, I'm not sure Hitler would have just dropped everything and said, let's throw these guys into the 
into the sea. So that's where I disagree. I think that Hitler, uh, the one thing about anybody, or all of us have read many biographies of Hitler, but the one thing one can say about him is he certainly had a grasp for the political and the political dimensions of throwing the allies into the sea in 1942 would have been too juicy a prospect for him to avoid. So I think he would have done everything possible to achieve that aim because granted, look at what it would have done strategically for him. It would have weakened the ability of a possibility of a second front coming in by 43, 44 for sure. And certainly disrupted the idea of knocking out the Italians. So it would have certainly been a high strategic priority for him to destroy any kind of beachhead. Um, and also when people are touching in on the issue of the fighting in, in, in North Africa, that would require further you know, investigation because we all know people go back and forth on this. Uh, but uh, you know, the whole question of the first encounter of the Americans in combat, uh, I, don't, I don't buy that historically is always a problem. I remember the book that was done by Heller, America's First Battles, which talked about how we basically fuck up every single first uh, encounter we have going back to the revolution. But, uh, but it'd be interesting to further and analyze this regarding uh, the question of uh, Sledgehammer. And another thing pops up, I wonder if Dunn or Grigsby are still alive who did those books on the 1943 operation. Uh, they did um, pretty persuasive books arguing that we could have landed in 43. I wonder what they have thought about this. And then uh, finally, people like, unfortunately, Carlo is, is past. Carlo Desky, he would have loved this. He would have had a great old time arguing with you. And uh, it would have been fun to have Carlo here, but maybe we can get Nigel as a, you know, quasi substitute. But uh, the book idea is to me interesting. There's always a lot to exploit. And yes, I would indeed want to hear what Ted has to say about this, since he's the only person here uh, who has uh, deeper scholarly knowledge than any of us on the war in Asia. But anyway, let me, let me bring Ted in. And so, you know, Ted, I'm going to force you to talk. And Joe, if you want to talk, please jump in. But let's hear what Ted has to say. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I want to say I, I really enjoy this whole process. You know, I love my counterfactuals and, and, and what ifs as a general, general rule. And uh, so little of the what ifs and counterfactuals were done before World War II in the Pacific. Oh, Ted, uh, Ted you, you muted, muted yourself, yourself or... Yeah, you got so excited. You made I I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did you? Did you? Give me a button, did you baby. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Put me in a commercial after that. Okay. Um, did, how far did I get? <laughs> you don't know. Uh, Hit the button. Just, saying, just start again. Yeah. Okay, I'll just start up again. I was just saying, with the first thing I wanted to say, I want to thank Gary uh, and for this whole procedure. I really love the idea of the counterfactuals in general. I, you know, I work on that area and thought about it a great deal. I love the idea of the book, uh, Jim, because uh, I've seen so much of this. But I'm, of course, I'm, I'm coming in at the very end of this session today, and I certainly didn't come in prepared to give the entire uh, Pacific the uh, imp implications for the Pacific. Uh, there are only a few things, and I don't have a list in front of me now. Unfortunately, I had a family crisis, so I had to uh, deal with it in Japan. Uh, so uh, I, I didn't come the way I planned to do when I told you I was going to work on this. But uh, there are two two things. One, I just, on a personal note, I want to mention this because it's just sort of this it's our group and we're friends. Um, I, I wouldn't be here probably if it hadn't been for the Kasserine disaster. Uh, my father was finish, fi finishing, had just finished his tra basic training and was in go off to offer school when they decided to send everybody back to training. So instead of being an infantry officer, my father became an air transport command officer and was sent to the Pacific where he met my mother and it goes on and on. But he, he, he was able to avoid combat because uh, all, like all the other young men who have said, it takes two steps forward, you're now an officer. I came <laughs> straight out of college, didn't know a damn thing about anything. But the Kasserine disaster had forced the army to retrain. And I always wanted to know more about that. Yeah, so put that aside. Now in Japan, the, uh, the, for, the, for the Pacific War, the, the theater here is, as it happened in 1944, when the, Jap when the Americans landed at Saipan, uh, there were many people in the Japanese high command. Of course, they'd gone through the Italian, watching the Italian collapse. And they were very concerned. The Japanese uh, high command was very, very concerned. And Tojo personally was very concerned about the a possibility of a coup against him at, the, at that time. So in 44, uh, they, had, they had seen the idea of, a, of a, a, a war turning badly and you having to prepare for the end of it. Uh, 
<clears throat> so, but they had the thought in 40, back in 42, uh, when things were going perfectly well, they had just suffered the uh, ignominy of the uh, mid midway defeat. But, uh, but the Japanese, uh, as I said, I'm, I didn't finish my story. Um, the reason when Saipan happened, the Japanese almost immediately assumed that they couldn't possibly be a, uh, uh, Right before that, they, they couldn't possibly be an invasion of Saipan because the Americans and allies had just landed in, in Normandy. Actually, got, got the sequence backwards there. And so there was this sort of a week or so, or several days when the Japanese um, high command was saying, well, that's the end of that. Uh, and so they had this sort of terrible moment. So I think in 42, uh, and like we're talking now 43 late, when we're in the middle of the Guadalcanal campaign, the Japanese army's high command still hasn't uh, focused on the fact that the Americans are, are launching a counteroffensive. The Japanese high command was still fighting the war in China. China was only concerned with the war in China. There's almost no effort in the Japanese army uh, to even deal with, with um, Guadalcanal. It was considered an inconvenience. The Navy uh, is focusing on it. So uh, how, much of a, how much of an impact would the landing in Northern uh, Europe have at that moment, except perhaps causing a panic? Uh, but I, I want the level of, of, of expertise and the level of detail, which I find extraordinarily exciting to me as a specialist. I wish the Japanese hadn't, uh, hadn't made it so hard to get the kind of detail information about either individuals, which is I spent my career on looking at Japanese army officers and their careers uh, in, uh, before I became a, a teacher and before I became an oral historian. That's what I was trying to do is find out who they were. And it's still hard to find out. But to get the details of the operational plans, the way you, you've been able to do uh, here is something I'm greatly envious of. But to just to see, uh, knowing that the Japanese had in plan when Midway happened, the invasion of Hawaii was their long their long term plan. The, uh, operation, which I've always argued that was highly possible, uh, highly you know, with a high level of success, if it hadn't been happened right after a disaster for the Midway, uh, uh, the, the the impact on the Pacific theater would, of course, been trem tremendous if the American forces were had to be cut back for an operation like that. I don't know uh, how many divisions would have been um, uh, would have had to be. Uh, diverted and without torch and i've argued argue this because i studied the french indochina china uh, during the war without torch uh french indochina china would have still probably been uh, they were still collaborating very actively with the japanese i'm not sure thailand would have survived that uh the french uh, they wanted to push more and more into that area the french uh, uh, colonial forces were helping the japanese in that in that area in collaboration so it's a complicated story in late 42 43 but for the japanese and i guess the most important thing i would say here without all the preparation that i had, had intended to look at the the actual uh, order of a battle and such is that the japanese were uh, still not focused on fighting the americans on the ground war uh, the marines were concerned about the marines because they could see that they could land on an island just as they, just as they could but they weren't particularly concerned about that being decisive. Uh, they were scared off by the, the, you know, the Abdullah raid, of course, but there was no threat to Japan's homeland at this time uh, from, uh, from the mainland. And they were not doing that as badly as we would like to believe, and Chinese, and Chinese historians would like us to believe they were doing on the mainland. They were bogged down, they were in, they were in trouble. But the political uh, developments in China, I'm gonna go out on a limb here, the political uh, developments in China in late 42 were better than, um, uh, is usually accredited. The Japanese were, were working out uh, their collaborationist regime, uh, the Wang Jingwei regime, when they were working out with him. And it, it seemed that they had been, been able to establish a fairly stable uh, base in, uh, in central China. So they were desperate for resources, of course. For, for, for natural resources. So having control of Southeast Asia, could they could develop it if American and the British fleets uh, stayed sunk after, after, as the Z force uh, had, had been, and there was no, no reinforcing fleet coming to uh, Singapore now under Japanese control, the Japanese probably wouldn't have been as panicked as they should have been about what was gonna come because they didn't react dramatically uh, to, you know, it's, a shock, it's shocking to believe, but they didn't react as dramatically to how bad the situation was. And they knew it. And one of my points in my current research, I did some work on this, is that the Japanese war planning and Japanese war gaming before the war and particularly the political war gaming all showed the results that we're going we're to get in 44, 45. And they knew that was coming, uh, any, anyone who was following the, uh, the results, so that they had to get the war over with. So if the war in Europe ended earlier, you know, I, I, liked, I like Frank's uh, Russian, Russian steamroller sweeping across uh, all of uh, Eastern Europe. That would have not been very po popular with Churchill, I'm sure. But uh, I don't know how the Japanese high command would have been able to react by 43. The Japanese had to rebuild their Navy. And of course they did rebuild their Navy. They did a tremendous job rebuilding the Navy, but they were just outbuilt, you know, four to one, five to one, 10 to one. 
by the U.S. <clears throat> so I don't have a great deal to, to add to that, uh, it's, except to say that the politics for Japan would have been um, quite, quite dramatically impacted uh, at the psychological level. But we have to remember that Germany and Japan were not highly co were not cooperating very, very well. I mean, submarines went back and forth, uh, and there were some some missions back and forth. But the strategic, grand strategic planning of a of the drive uh, through the Middle East uh, to link up with the Japanese in India wasn't happening. And the Japanese dream of a <clears throat> had never happened. It was never going to happen. But the, the Japanese dream of a liberating India was just really getting underway. And of course, I think De we can argue that Gandhi was messing that up uh, because he wasn't causing a break, a, a collapse in the Indian Empire. Uh, he was uh, acting in a rather rational uh, manner for an independent, seeking an independent India, but he wasn't going to destroy the entire British Empire in doing that. Uh, uh, at least, like I, my general impression is, is that. Uh, and the Japanese had, while well, they had Burma, they still hadn't any way to supply it yet. They were getting ready for that, and of course, they made the terrible mistake of in, invading in '44. Yeah. So that's all, that's it. Yeah, I'll answer questions if I can ask. Yeah, yeah, but I also want to mention that we have Greg Boggan here. And Be Greg is an Air Force historian. Oh, He's Greg, a, yeah. Right. Yeah. RAF. And so it'd be very interesting to hear Greg do his analysis of this whole period from the point of view of the air offensive and the RAF in particular, because they would, of course, had to bear a tremendous burden in this kind of operation. So maybe down the road, Greg, we could hear your thoughts about this uh, from, you know, so let's get the whole tri-dimensional aspect of how to understand this in gear. Hey, well, Thank you. Okay. Yeah, let's go to Mike then, since he's for another question, I guess. Mike, are you there? Actually, didn't Joe? You can let Joe speak for. Did oh. Joe Jones have a uh, question? Yeah, we've been. J Joe, come on. Yeah, so, uh, get, my, yeah. some cynicism here, Gary. Uh, I appreciate <laughs> your talk, even though I didn't agree with all of it. But one thing I have a problem with are you sure that Hitler and Stalin can't make another deal? I mean, they made one previously. This whole idea of a second front to me is kind of ridiculous because we don't owe the Russians anything. And look at all that Hitler has done for Stalin. I mean, he's eliminated those troublesome Western provinces, you know, the Baltics, the Ukrainians, Belarus. A lot of those people are starving or dead. You know, so you you sure that you can count on Stalin to keep up his end of the, the bargain and keep the war going? Well, it's the exact opposite, really. Uh, it's the failure to come through with the second front that some historians have uh, pointed out probably was the impetus between the secret talks that were going on between Stalin and Hitler during early 1943. And the fact that the uh, FDR and Churchill manipulated and lied to Stalin about what they were doing. Um, and in the end, um, Stalin, uh, decides that you know there really is nothing what, what's in it for stalin why would he do that if he's going to win already aligned with what's him, the yeah, win? you gotta have two boys but war. anyway that but realistically it's the other way around mm -hmm. it's the other way around it's when they don't get the second front that stalin but i think probably he's just trying to sound out what what his, uh, hitler's you know he's trying to fa find out what hitler's up to. I don't not sure he really, really wants to do it, but he's definitely very upset with the allies. Okay. Yes, but but okay, Gary, like, he's lying. He, he has his second front. Front. There's no he reason there's nothing in it for Stalin. No, no, he has his second front. The Atlantic Ocean is his second front. The Pacific Ocean is his second front. North Africa, he's got fronts all over the place. The only person who's not fighting on two fronts is Stalin. Okay. He, he does even the Chinese send troops to Burma, even if only for a few weeks. Stalin doesn't, you know, so the idea that we owe Stalin something, it's amazing. But, you know, that's my opinion. I know you disagree. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not really saying that uh, I really feel, tr truthfully, one of the things I didn't bring up is I really feel if things had turned out the way I'm thinking it would have, but I, I mean, it's, it's going down so many counterfactual rabbit holes. You can't really say what's going to happen. It could have happened like Frank, but if it does come turn out the way I'm thinking it was, really the chief beneficiary is Great Britain. They need to get the war over as fast as possible because the longer it goes, the more they're going to be eclipsed by the Russian bear. You know, you know, that's what Churchill's saying at Tehran, you know, the poor little English donkey between the Russian bear and the and the American elephant. Well, get the damn war over and you're going to, because first of all, you're going to be in command of Sledgehammer. You're, one of your generals is, 
the, the Americans who can see that, obviously, they're, they're going to get some divisions in that, you know, Marshall's clear. I'm not, I would love for you to go earlier than September, October, but I'm not going to really insist on it because I can't really help you until then. So morally, he doesn't feel like he can do that. But anyway, they've already conceded that the British would lead it. The British, uh, at some point, the Americans are going to go past if this goes into 43. The Americans are going to go past what the British can do. But by that time, it's all in their pocket, so to speak. Uh, it's just going to continue on from what started. So they're going to get more prestige out of it. And it's going to be over sooner. And they're just going to look better. So I just feel like they're going to get the most. Of it. And actually, the person, if Frank is not correct, which he might be, it's a good, it's a good thing. I, I don't think he's correct, but it's certainly a possibility about the Russians rolling. Um, they have the most to lose. I still feel like even if they do get to sever that southern wing, they still got the Rapuscis, they still got the, the, the muddy roads, they still they, they don't have the trucks, that the hundreds of thousands of trucks that they're going to get later in the war. And um, yeah, they're going to be, uh, the Germans are going to be able to do a fighting retreat. And I do agree with Frank on another thing. I do think there's a higher probability that they're, that somebody takes Hitler out at that point particular you know if Stalingrad falls at the same time as the as the there's a breakout in the west it's so ob you know Stalingrad was a huge blow to German morale okay but they kind of rallied with the, in February and and thus and such so I think you know but if you have you have the war falling apart on two fronts at the same time it's like we got to do something about this guy. So, and then when, and if that happens, God knows what I, but I do think if that does happen, then the powers that be in Germany, uh, the new powers that be are going to send all their troops to the Eastern front <laughs> and let the, uh, the Western allies in, um, uh, you know, which of course is going to cause, would cause diplomatic problems, but, um, I don't see long-term prospects. Of, and, uh, I think Greg was trying to say something, but he kept himself muted. So, Greg, if you had something to add. You're, you're muted, so you got to unmute. If... <laughs> yeah, you're muted, Greg. You got to <laughs> whichever. Oh, right. There I just discovered yeah. how to unmute myself. <laughs> oh, I thought I had to put you on in. No, 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 no. You're muted. <laughs> um, I can't remember what I was going to say now. <laughs> <laughs> But it has been fascinating listening to all your views here. Um, I can't say I agree with all of them, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. And um, if you want me to do something on the RAF sometime, and I'll, I'll take you through that. But, you know, it, in a nutshell, basically what happened in Britain was that we couldn't afford, like the Americans, the Americans are very rich, we couldn't afford to go down the bomber route and the sort of conventional combined arms forces route we had to choose one and we chose the wrong one and we were stuck with it and we should have been able to invade France in 1942 we weren't because the bomber mafia had control and they were frightening the living daylights out of Churchill um, about what we could and what we couldn't do and most of it was misinformation things like the short range of the Spitfire there's a load of nonsense Portal knew it could cover the um sledgehammer um there was no problem at all um things like that and brooke of course well he was he was as somebody pointed out he was still pessimistic on the um, on the eve of d-day he still thought it was um, a, a major issue so plenty to talk about there but the, the the one problem that the the british had was that we actually abandoned our tactical air force as soon as we lost in france we scrapped the tactical air force went totally for the strategic bomber force so in 1942, we had no tactical air force to support a landing. And that, <laughs> from the air point of view, would have been fatal. Yeah. It wasn't about numbers. It wasn't about range of fighters. It was all about how we planned to use the air force. Mm -hmm. And the, the air ministry, I'm afraid, blocked the development of a tactical air force. And that probably would have been fatal for a sledgehammer in 1942. Greg, is there is there a good book on that? Because I know that there's a good book on the development of the American tactical air in um you know through the war 
Craig's writing. I've got the author's right name. Now. <laughs> well, there's, there's an excellent book on it. It's mine. It's his. <laughs> <laughs> it's that, can, I, can I ask a question on this? One, as, an Austra- as someone who's hey, been visiting Australia. Hang on, look, 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 there it is. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I think I've so seen it. Of, yeah, one, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, one, one of the major issues I came and encountered in Australia, as an unknown story for most Americans, is the number of Australians who died in the bombing campaign on Germany. How many Australians were involved in that? Do you do you have any idea how that might have affected the whole manpower issue if the Australians hadn't been actively involved, had well, been able Canadian. to be drawn on? Yeah, the Canadians as well were um, Canadians involved. too. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a, a huge um, factor in the in the Australian War Memorial. It was, it was a huge, huge manpower area. issue because it wasn't yeah. just the bomber command; it was the whole industry that was focused on building these bombers. Um, yeah. So that meant that we were relying on America to supply all our tanks, tactical aircraft, etc., because we couldn't afford to do it ourselves. I mean, it was a mistake that we made way back in the 20s and 30s when we decided to go down this bomber route. For us, it was disastrous. It's OK for Americans because you could afford it, but we couldn't. OK, so um, again, we're running out of time. So let's um, mm. Mike. Quickly, yeah. and then Frank. Yeah. Let me put a um, um, a little uh, kibosh on this whole anti bomber. Uh, um, mm-hmm. First of all, there's a difference between carpet bombing and precision bombing. Mm. We all know that. Um, pound for pound, if I can use that term, um, precision bombing was by far and away the more highly effective uh, style of bombing. Okay, that being said, also, People seem to say, well, they bombed this and it did nothing. As anybody who could tell you who was in the vicinity of, not, of uh, the World Trade Center, the former World Trade Center on 9-11, when you knock down a building, it has an effect. Even if it's only a delay, even if they rebuild, that delay has an effect, especially when the other side is not being bombed and is actually developing their industrial capacity at a greater rate. That's one thing. Two... Um, the idea, first of all, I have to tell you, Gary, uh, don't, it doesn't bolster your argument by trying to get inside Alan Brooks head, probably incorrectly, rather than, um, Alan Brooks trying to, uh, make Marshall, you know, in other words, distorting the facts to make Marshall look bad. He might've been able, he might've been making Marshall look bad because he didn't agree with the facts. And this goes back to what? I, I agree with that. Um, the, but the idea is that um, Alan Brooks' assessment of the situation, he's a very thoughtful and very careful person, as I understand it. And he, he made an assessment. And the idea of the, Brit- of the RAF, t- uh, the lack of a developed RAF tactical force um, was probably part of it. Um, he made an assessment and he said, this isn't a good bet. To put it in poker terms, this is like chasing, chasing an inside straight when the other guy already has a high pair of three of a kind on board. Um, can it work? Yeah, but it's not that good a bet, and you don't bet the farm on it. And putting six and poss- the equivalent of seven British divisions um, in the Cotentin P- uh, Peninsula, and basically keeping them there until the Americans arrive and probably keeping there, keeping them there even when the Americans arrive um, was probably that's as far as I'm concerned, putting too many of your pieces in one spot for no substantial gain. Yes. You could say it's, it's a possibility. They could have broken out. They could have gone all the way to Germany and ended the war by 1943, but that's an inside straight. Okay. The odds are against it. It's not a good bet. That's what I'm saying. We can say we can have counterfactuals as to whether or not this could happen. But the probability, even the possibility that it could happen, is what had to be assessed. Because we did not have, especially in 1942, anywhere near unlimited resources. We did not have an unlimited capability. And the fact of the matter is, an assessment was done. And they decided, not a good bet. Uh, the better bet may be to go to North Africa and take our time with this 
and get some additional training. Actually, Brooke didn't want to go to North Africa either. <laughs> what? He was willing to, to uh, agree with the Americans. They didn't want to go at, at the July meetings, but the politicians said you had to well, do something. I mean, but anyway, let me just say, okay, you're making the same argument. Uh, let me just tell you his assessment from the following May. This is Alan Brooke. Uh, there and this is on documented as part of the conference records. He says, "Well, my assessment doesn't this word assessment, but he says, hey, we're not going to be ready to go do a cross-channel attack until 1945 or even 1946. 1946. Yeah, that last time the Jefferson, you know, I mean, uh, the French kids, school kids will be finished their first year of Russian. Uh, so I don't really put stock in his." his uh, appreciation. He was a pessimist. He didn't want to go in 1943 either. Montgomery did. Montgomery was on record said, yeah, let's give it a go in 43. I guess this is before they do St uh, Sicily, obviously, so they can't do both. But he just was not down for the, and, and people have already mentioned his diary entries. He's predicting, uh, you know, practical disaster on the following day on uh, June the 5th 1944 so I'm sorry I don't you know I mean I don't <laughs> hate the man I really feel he, <laughs> he sincerely thought it would would not work and that's why he said did some things that you know maybe weren't told they're they're at the worst things he didn't send men to their death you know on purpose to to uh ruin someone else's career or or their argument or something he was trying to say what he thought would be a disaster and uh but i just don't his judgment doesn't doesn't prove out in many different ways and i've just mentioned some some and i could mention more i, I don't really this was the yeah, key thing in, in um, 1942 that churchill liked somebody with a definite plan and portal had a definite plan he said we can win the war in two years if we keep bombing germany <laughs> And Brooke was, well, I don't know, possibly, who knows? Yeah. And, put, and Churchill preferred somebody with a plan, somebody who was definite, somebody, and that's why he went down the bomber route from March 1942. All right. Well, the I, I think he went down the, around the, uh, the clock bomber route most enthusiastically, but um, when that was pre uh, presented by Acre. But the, the idea is that um, mm. uh, I've already given <clears throat> said what I had, uh, something about the uh, bomber situation, but the idea of Allen Brook as being, shall we say, a pessimist was perhaps a necessary counterpoint to this kind of, since we're talking in these terms, American arrogance and American opportunism, which is saying, hey, we got a window of opportunity. Let's go grab it. We're going to kick ass and go all the way to the top. Uh, no, no. Maybe that counterpoint was necessary. Yes, Alan Brooke I may mean, have been. I mean, he's a counterpoint. So he might be right. I can never, you know, I, I was introduced to someone saying that I, I was convinced it should, it would have worked, and I'm not convinced. I'm really pushing it at, back against the skepticism. Like, there's no way for us to say it never happened. There's things that could have happened, but if you just look at all the evidence, it just <coughs> so much of it lines up in favor of it working okay but there's I, this I one thing that maybe <laughs> i'm glossing over or may or, or things that i never thought of or none of us ever thought of that could have happened that could have made us so we don't know i and i don't know i'm just saying let's think about it in a different way are you telling me that two of the biggest powers in the whole world britain's been at war for three years united states started to, to uh mobilize for war in the spring of 1940 that draft in the in the fall of 1940 okay this isn't coming from a standing start so these two great mm -hmm. powers cannot between the two of them capture a a poorly defended uh peninsula just 65 miles away from the coastline of one of those powers and hold it off? I mean, are you kidding me? That yeah, right. if that's true, if that's true, then it's an indictment on the um, the leadership of both countries. They the either by themselves should have had enough to be able to do that minimal task <laughs> if they had the will to do it. I say they should have had the ability to do it. They should have had the resources and the capabilities to do it. And I do think they will. Whether it would have worked in, in, under any circumstances, again, it's counterfactual. We cannot say. 
but they both had the resources and the capabilities by a wide margin to pull off that little of a of a uh, of an operation. And whether it went past then or not, I don't know. I, but I, my argument is it didn't need to to have a major impact and beneficial impact on the World War II. So, yeah, the big question is why wasn't it possible in 1942? And you're probably right, it probably would have failed, but why it shouldn't have done, not in 1942. But this is the difference between reality. I mean, what happens on the ground, what happens in real life, and what looks like a, a grand scheme. Because you can also say, and I don't want, I'm not moving this into a discussion on this issue. Why couldn't a great power like the United States just walk over and win in Vietnam in, in a matter of weeks? I mean, there's this little country. It's got no, very little industrial capacity. Why didn't we do it? The idea is once you get to real life and the reality on the ground, things are different. People like Allen Brook, not just Allen Brook, but a lot of people looked at it and said, okay, now you, you seem to think, Gary, that it probably, no, we can't say it definitely, you're not saying it definitely would have worked, but the odds were in its favor. I'm saying that's a bad odds assessment. Now, maybe I've done that's your opinion. Uh, well, yeah. There were British More people uh, gambling uh, Mountain Mountain and thought it would work. Uh, now, maybe he's not the best judge of these things, uh, but a lot of the, the British planners that were working on it thought it would work too as well. So the people that really were looking at the nuts and bolts and weren't saying something was 165 miles when it was 17 miles and weren't ignoring the fact that even if the uh, uh, port was blown up, they had other ways to get uh, supplies in through Cherbourg and et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera and then weren't making ridiculously uh, pessimistic uh, 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 predictions about what the German Air Force could do were making actually very realistic uh, projections. Those people thought it could work. So I don't know, but we'll never know. Well, we'll well, never well, know. All well, I know is it's not this guy. We're more interested in knocking down the miss because right, I can't prove it. All right, let's oh, no, you, uh, what, uh, go on, Frank. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at wet bulb. Wet bulb had no chance of succeeding. Absolutely no chance. Period. But um, you're, you're also missing out that we're going back to, to Stalin for a moment. Um, the big failure from his point of view was not Sledgehammer, actually. It was PQ-17. PQ-17 meant that instead of getting the lend lease guaranteed 80 plus thousand trucks, because PQ-17 didn't get through, he only got about 20,000, okay? That is why he didn't make that last 20 miles. Now, had Sledgehammer happened, I, I've argued that, yes, it would have withdrawn, Hitler would have withdrawn troops, or as Jim points out, because that would have been the ideal moment to actually win in a propaganda coup against the, the West by defeating a landing, which would have been relatively easy. I'm sorry to tell you, but... Uh, but it's PQ-17 that's the failure from his point of view. So there's nothing much you can, you can do about that other than, you know, divert forces from the Pacific, which you weren't going to do, you know, in order to bolster the... Uh, about PQ, having more PQs? PQ-17. In other words, because of the threat of turbulence, you need more capital ship. Huh? What about PQ-17 failed. Because it failed, you weren't going to get... The, the necessary PQ convoys between then and Operation of Uranus and Saturn. So he's short on at least 80,000 uh, trucks and, Actually, and a sundry either, stuff. You either didn't believe what I said before or you missed what I said before. I, I immediately went by it really quickly. First of all, there is a PQ-18, right? I know there's a PQ-18, but that, okay. but what was okay. supposed to well, happen? The reason why there wasn't more PQs is because they'd taken all the, um, they taken all the escorts to open up this new line of communication. Okay, so if you really look at the at what was available, was really available because you don't need. You don't need that many escorts in the English Channel. They have all the air ass assets, and I don't want to go into all the details. But if you look at the resources that the Americans applied to 
opening up now the mid-Atlantic uh, convoys, which wouldn't have needed to happen. And you just took a, a, a portion of those and applied them to the, uh, to the PQ route, you, uh, you could have kept those going. And on top of that, every you're time saying, you take some you're, in, you get wait, some wait, wait, out. Wait. You're saying that with, if Sledgehammer ham, ham had gone off, then there were, this is a, you know, this is another leisure demand. I mean, you're saying that because of Torch taking too much of the the capacity, to, uh, carrying capacity of the of the uh, cargo vessels, um, there would have been more PQ convoys, even with Sledgehammer. Sledgehammer would have taken absolutely everything and then some, whatever was sent to to torch because it absolutely had to succeed. No, because you're using whereas, your coasters. Where's torch? Huh? You're using the coasters to bring over all the English, uh, uh, the British stuff. Yes, I'm sorry. It there's has no capacity. way. There's large, no way. Margin. Huh? That's ridiculous to argue that that the torch would have taken more than than this operation that absolutely had to succeed. It's not. It, there's not the same. Oh, I'm not saying it's going to take more supplies. I'm saying it's going to take less transit uh, or ocean going transport. It would have of taken absolutely take more supplies. everything because you cannot supply. If you're putting only twenty six thousand a week of troops into the continent, you cannot possibly. Yeah, but is that that is not all. correct. I, I think I tried to address that. Well, the planners right, did not know the that's resources right, that they had. Uh, that's. Oh. I mean, think well, about yeah, okay. okay, Frank, let me ask you this. Why is it you can only get 26,000 a week, 65 miles, but you can do more than so. that over 2,500 miles? Because <laughs> they said they so. Had four, they brought up, they brought over 400,000 troops in two, uh, less than two months from um, into uh, North Africa for the first two uh, months of torch. And it's a 2,500 mile trip at minimum. Why can't you bring even more than 400,000 when you only got 65 miles to go? That's a fair argument. That you should, plus, that, you can, that, plus, you can put that's a fair uh, argument. Joe, I, guess, I think Joe's gone. Looking at, he, he, their their the, arguments the, I think, at uh, the time. Greg knows this too. The, one their the arguments at the like, time. Hey, we can put people on any kind of ship and get them across. We just have to supply them. And you can't do that. You can do that across the English Channel. You can't do that over th through the North Atlantic. Well, yeah, you can put them in dinghies, I guess, if you're if well, you're that dinghy, satisfied. You can put them in trawlers. If, you, if you've got air superiority, I would put them in dinghies, <laughs> right? But if you haven't got air superiority, you don't even think about you it. Do it at night. night. We'll get that one. At all right. night. All right, all right, all right, yes. all right, all right. That's what they were planning on doing. All right. All right, listen, listen, That's listen, the plan. listen. Uh, in listening to this, it's clear we're going to have to do a separate session on exploitation. <laughs> yes, because, yes, because the whole thing uh, exploitation. Let's bring, let's bring Mark in. Mark, Mark, you got you just your question, Mark. Yeah, sure, Gary. Um, what I'm wondering if, if the um, you were critical of Alan Brooks, um, um, not speech, but to you know to the um, to the War Cabinet. I'm wondering if I mean if you read his uh, diary, one of the th one of his main activities during the entire war was kiboshing Churchill's crazy ideas. So that's kind of in his DNA right now. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also the, the phrase, the, you know, the phraseology, the British phraseology of our Italians. So at that time, the Americans hadn't performed all that well, um, certainly not as well as the British. And plus throughout the, you know, uh, after Dunkirk, the British were really shy of, taking any casualties. And I'm wondering if that's just kind of the main base where like the British were saying, no, 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 we're not risking this. Yeah, I mean, that came up last week and I think that that is part of the reason they don't want to do it. And as I say, I don't really, I'm not really that interested in getting into their personal predilections and this and that for the most part. Um, I, 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 I try to respond to people and say, well, Brooke said this, so therefore it must be right. And I try to give, you know, push back against that. And again, I go back to what I said. He said in May of 43 that they not they need at least two years and maybe three years to get across the channel. So I, um, yes, he does, you know, uh, I mean, <sighs> Churchill was wrong about just about every, it's almost amazing how much, how many 
things he was wrong about. So I, I don't really want to get into that. I'm really trying to look at resources and capabilities. It's a strategic thing. The variable we're looking at is decisions these guys make. Okay, so if we get into their head and say, well, they would have done this, but that's what we're, it's like saying, well, we can't really say that Hitler made a mistake by invading the Soviet Union because he wanted to invade the Soviet Union. No, you can still say it's a mistake <laughs> and give all the reasons why he thought it, might, it still was a mistake, okay, or, or it wasn't, depending on your point of view. So one of the great uh, counterfactuals. I just, I just, I like it as a war game, as it, you know, like, uh, Sam Pegridi saying, you know, history is this laboratory of, of war, you know, so we can try out these concepts. And um, so okay. uh, now I did notice. Yeah, Gareth, give us a uh, summary. I think we're, it's yeah, we're yeah, three really, hours now. Somebody wanted Maybe to say summarize that, yeah. what I thought were the main myths that are around it. One is, uh, uh, you know, there weren't enough landing craft. B, uh, the air war hadn't been won yet. Uh, C, the logistics weren't there. Uh, D, there's this major improvement in, uh, especially with the Americans between 42 and 44. Um, and those are probably the main ones right there. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, Gary, that's enough, isn't it? That's right. You know, well, I can see your, your voice is getting hoarse. And yeah, what, what, important, what, what, job. What, what most important person we want to thank here besides everybody is Kenny. Kenny Aaron in LA, who's patiently put up with all of us Thanks, yakking Kenny. and arguing away for three hours. We want to thank <laughs> Ken for being so so good natured about being an engineer and everything. So a clap for uh, Ken here. And uh, obviously, this you know, I mean, uh, the last part. I know Mike wants to jump in there, but uh, the last part of this uh, discussion. Yeah, I think we really should talk about the next phase. Okay, they land. Then what the hell? What? And then just do something on that. Because that's counterfactual, counterfactual, but then it sort of gets us into all the different ramifications. And that's where I think your argument is completely weak. But anyway, we'll get into that another time. <laughs> so, but I want to thank you so much, Gary. It's always great to hear you talk. It's really terrific. Uh, it's great to have you here, Greg, and all these other guys uh, and folks. It's really good. Alex, thanks. Thanks so much for shep shepherding all these uh, type alpha A blabbermouths mm -hmm. here. It was very important for you to do that. Like um, I'm not, yeah. Yeah, all of us. Yeah, all of us, of course. <laughs> and Gary, it's always great. You know, it's it's too bad Joe isn't around. He, of course, provoked it. Then you provoked it even more to even do this. Joe's here. Oh, Joe Strange. Oh, okay. Joe, Joe Strange. Joe yeah. Split. Yeah. It's yeah. a dissertation. Vince checked out too. I guess we just yeah, yeah. With Vin Vincent Vin groaning Vin on too long. I, I, I and just, uh, I David 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 didn't get a chance to get a question in. Yeah, <laughs> well, the rest of us yacked on. David here. I want to. He came and then he left. He came and then he left. I think. I want to. I want to. Uh, I want to acknowledge Gary. Gary, I've never seen anybody put up with being a voodoo doll as well as you have. <laughs> You know, there you are. People go, oh, I want to put a pin in. I want to put a pin in. I want to put a pin in. Yeah, I mean, it's very young is a nest. It really is because it really elicits a lot of, uh, and I think it's that newspaper article at the end. Nobody wants to be told that they, their country didn't do what they maybe could have done. So, <laughs> which it's I just, I we're just it. talking about an alternative reality. That's all it is. It's just yeah. an alternative well, reality. Well, Kenny, what, what's so important about this alternative reality is that, as Gary knows and all of us know, these kind of arguments have been going on ever since the end of the World War II. Yeah. They've dominated the politics of countries in discussing the war. They've dominated, uh, actually, Cold War politics. If we look at what Putin argues in terms of his rewriting World War II history, he would argue basically, oh, Gary, we got to bring you in. We're going to make you a hero of Russians. Yeah, so. I've always been afraid that that offer would come out. 